we may look at the environment not only from the point of view of biodiversity benefits which we always talk talk about but one of the striking benefit which is intangible if we go to see is the capacity to quarantine the deadliest viruses bacteria and so many microbial uh, uh, issues which could each turn into a pandemic and we have just seen covid pandemic which is not yet over and we are th- talking about third wave and such things and uh, in such a, a fearful situation such a conference would be a uh, would act like a lighthouse for not only the intellects but the general public uh, and many people who have participated so without delaying further i think i thank the organizers for organizing this and assure that any good activity any good initiative wherever gsbb can be a part will always be there thank you so much thank you dr sir mukadam and we uh, gratefully acknowledge your active support and collaboration collaborative spirit in all our activities and we look forward to the support in uh, days to come for more events of uh, mutual interest uh, it will only be appropriate to set the tone of this webinar by inviting dr nandkumar kamath to deliver his opening remarks it is my pleasure to introduce dr kamath who of course is very well known to many here as a multifaceted personality of science and humanities and erudite scholar disciplined researcher and i would say a man of field laboratory and letters uh, let me quickly introduce dr nandkumar kamath uh, he has been a former faculty member at the department of botany goa university he is a chemistry graduate a national merit scholar of government of india a biochemistry post graduate from the prestigious and asia oldest goa medical college and a phd of course in microbiology from ctir university of mumbai Uh, Dr Kamath specializes in microbial diversity with deep interest in multiple dimensions to name a few ecology ecology biodiversity taxonomy biology bioprospecting biotechnical biotechnological dimensions of microbes with experience of field and lab based research for a whopping 35 years on eubacteria actinobacteria yeasts macrophagia of goa and the western ghats in particular Dr Kamath has taught virology microbiology advanced ecology bioinformatics hemoinformatics glycobiology and the list goes on applied mycology fungal biotechnology mushroom biotechnology enology at postgraduate level for over two decades and has guided six phd students and many more uh, working under him even as of now he has supervised about 75 plus masters dissertation Uh, presently, Dr. Kamath works as a consultant on microbial diversity for Goa State Biodiversity Board, as Dr. Sarma Kadam has just mentioned. And very interestingly, something for all of us to emulate and feel very enthused about. He is pursuing his PhD in philosophy at Goa University on a very interesting theme, which is pertinent and very much relevant to the theme of today's webinar: bioethics of COVID-19 pandemic. He has written more than 100 popular articles on various aspects of viruses and viral diseases and has guided the state government of Goa and the local print and electronic media throughout the present pandemics with his pandemic trajectory which of course to a large extent was statistically very very contrary uh requesting dr nandkumar kamath to please give his opening remarks thank you so much dr kamath for accepting this invite the session is yours Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I hope uh, you can all hear me clearly. Uh, if it could be a little louder, Doctor Kamath, that would be better. I hope uh, you can hear me clearly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. You can. Okay, you can. Fine. Yeah. I am closer to the mic now. Yeah. Uh, this is a topic which is for professionals and not for faint-hearted because virology was never for faint-hearted. It's a very very serious topic. Uh, I am happy here because this is a very important historic event today and i extend my congratulations and greetings to the apostolate of carmelite congregation and especially sister maria lizin principal of the prestigious college uh good evening to convener and organizing secretary my good old friend and professional colleague in the field of biodiversity research professor manoj porkar members of the organizing and sessions committees member secretary of GSBB Dr. Pradeep Sarmukadam was my ex-student and he is my present employer. I am here only because of your interest. 
I also welcome the speakers of the day, Dr. Shalmala Srinivasulu, participating from Hyderabad. Thank you, sir. The well-known NRI scientist and expert on today's topic, Dr. Arinjay Banerjee, participating from Canada. Incidentally, I have in this city my Sikh married sister-in-law residing. And finally, uh, I can see in the list uh, the principal of Don Bosco School of Agriculture, Sulparna, plant pathologist and uh, respected virologist, Dr. Suresh Kumkoikar, who has been my teacher in the field of molecular virology for past two decades. In my village, Santa Cruz, every evening since childhood, I used to watch a swarm of fruit bats on the giant peak tree. My interaction with the bats increased in past 20 years at the Goa University, where thousands of fruit bats land at night to raid the fruit-bearing trees. My opening remarks would try to set the ball rolling with some general to specific ideas, finally culminating with concern which we have for the state of Goa and I hope to complete within 15 allotted minutes. We all know that bats fly with wings which range in span from 130 millimeters to 2 meters. They feed on insects, mammals, fish, blood, fruit, and pollen. Bats of most species ecolocate to navigate and to find prey. They are found on all continents except Antarctica. Bats are also being increasingly recognized as reservoir hosts for viruses which can cross species barriers. We call it spillover to infect humans and other domestic and wild mammals. Nonetheless, studies of natural histories of bats and their importance as reservoir hosts of zoonotic viruses largely have been underappreciated, they are not properly funded, except for their role in maintaining and transmitting rabies virus where there is a lot of attention. But irrespective of the negative public perception of bats, they are critical elements of all terrestrial biotic communities. Of the more than 4,600 recognized species of mammals, 925 or about 22% are bats, and they are grouped into two suborders, Megashiroptera containing a single family, Today, 42 genera comprising 166 species and microchiroptera containing 16 bat families with 135 genera comprising 759 species. Bats are as old as Himalaya mountain range. This is very interesting because they evolved early and have changed relatively little in comparison with mammals of other taxa. Although the fossil record of bat evolution is incomplete, a recent analysis of 17 nuclear genes dated the origin of chirot. Uh, Terrans to the Eocene period, that is 50 to 50 million years ago when Himalaya mountains had formed. This is coincident with a significant rise in global temperature. Three major micro chiropteran lineages were traced to Laurasia and a fourth for certain zoonotic viruses maintained in bats, such as the Henipa viruses and Lysa viruses. This suggests a long history of post speciation. Bats are the second most diverse mammalian order on Earth after rodents. And they have been identified as natural reservoir hosts for several emerging viruses that can induce severe disease in humans. I found it very interesting when I was studying bat virome because it refers to the group of viruses associated with bats. But when I looked at the classification of bat viruses, I was surprised that it included all seven types described by the Baltimore classification system, including the double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, positive sense, single-stranded RNA, negative sense, single-stranded, positive sense, single-stranded, and double-stranded DNA viruses that replicate through a single-stranded RNA. So the greatest share is the family coronaviridae. The diseases induced by bat viruses in human include RNA viruses such as Marburg virus, Hindra virus, Sosuga virus, and Nipah virus. New evidence indicates that other emerging viruses such as Ebola viruses, severe acute, acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus, SARS-CO2 and Middle East respiratory coronavirus also originate in bats even if other hosts such as civets for SARS-CoV and camels for mad cov are proximate reservoirs for human infection. A growing list of emergent coronaviruses including the swine acute diarrhea syndrome coronavirus which emerged from horseshoe bats and killed more than 20,000 pigs and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic further underscores the ongoing threat of bat-borne viral emergence. Here are some quick glimpses of the present knowledge of bat viral diversity. They harbor a high viral diversity relative to the mammalian orders, reflective of the number of species with rodentia, rodents, and chiroptera bats containing the most species among mammals. This virus diversity demonstrates bats as an important taxonomic group for global viral discovery and zoonotic disease surveillance efforts. Bat research aims at identifying and mitigating 
future emergence events of bat bomb diseases. That's why this seminar is being held because of our state level concerns. This has led to identification of thousands of novel bat derived viral genomic sequences, but most of these sequences span polymerases and not the surface proteins that often govern cellular entry. So we don't have much knowledge on translating sequence data from novel viruses into a risk-based assessment to quantify zoonotic potential and elicit public health action. Besides our present understanding of the animals themselves, their distributions, behaviors, and interactions with the environment and the processes that led to contact with humans is still incomplete, therefore, this seminar is very important to raise global and national awareness. What we know about the viral diversity in bats? We have research from 1930s when Joseph Pavan first identified rabies virus in bats and experimentally infected several different bat species with the virus in Trinidad. Then there was explosion of research, especially in the last 20 years in bat virome, especially after the discovery and uh, isolation of SARS-related coronaviruses from bats in 2002. And because of technologies like next generation sequences or NGS, lots of progress was done in field research on other bat bone emerging pathogens, including Nipah virus, Marburg virus. But during past 20 years, the affordability of NGS have led to the identification of whole clats of viruses and genomic sequences, coronaviruses, MER, MERS, CO2, Tabis virus, Nipah virus, Hendra virus, new strains of influenza virus and Phyloviruses such as Zaire Ebola virus in various bat species. To date, thousands of new bat associated viral species have been discovered from at least 28 diverse viral families. But not all bat bone viruses can produce infections in humans. But experts still suspect that many of these viruses are likely host specific with limited zoonotic potential. They have found astroviruses are usually diverse and can be found in more than 30% of individual bat screen, yet. There are no known cases of spillover to humans of the astroviruses found in bats, but this could be because absence may also be due to lack of active surveillance for these viruses. Other bat burn viruses of concern include coronaviruses, Nipah viruses, Liza viruses, Pillow viruses because of their rapid evolutionary rate, pathogenicity in human or other host and proven ability to emerge. At this stage, we can say that despite an explosion of research on bat virome in past two decades, our knowledge of the global bat virome remains incomplete. That's why we are very interested in listening to these two expert talks. The challenges for future research include understanding the underexplored areas such as drivers underlying the viral diversity in bat, the patterns of viral co-infection and competition dynamics and the interactions between viruses and the bat microbiota. I'm sure the seminar would discuss all these areas today. What we know about the bats of Goa? The present knowledge of faunal diversity of Goa is based on surveys conducted by Zoological Survey of India. They identified 1,326 species of 17 groups. So more species could have been added. I'm not aware of them. The bats of Goa include 26 species. This is the old list. Indian followers fruit bat, Indian flying fox, short nose fruit bat, laser dog face fruit bat, pouch bearing tomb bat, long wing tomb bat, black bearded tomb bat, Theobald's tomb bat, lesser falls vampire bat, greater falls vampire bat, bleach horseshoe bat, Rufus horseshoe bat, Fulvus sleep nose bat, Kellogg's sleep nose bat, Schneider's sleep nose bat, Painted bat, Tickles bat, Horsefields bat, beautiful names, Kellogg's pipestril, Indian pipestril, three subspecies, Asiatic greater yellow house bat, I have found it in the university somewhere, Asiatic lesser yellow house bat, long big bat, or Schreiber's bat, and Egyptian three tailed bat. I think Dr. Manoj Borkar would be able to shed a lot of light on these bats of Goa. Finally, by research on bat viruses is important for Goa and full Western Ghats region of India. Because Goa has high viral diversity and high morbidity and mortality due to viral diseases per million individuals in India. Here is my compilation on the viruses in Goa and many other viruses are found in the bats, but we don't know anything about bat virome of state of Goa or for that matter adjoining bat virome of Western Ghat states. Here is the viral load encountered in our state of Goa, which uh, this report is not complete. It has been given to Goa State Biodiversity Board and the work is still uh, going on to compile all the work that has been done on viruses of Goa wherever it has been published. We have Japanese encephalitis, which is under control. We have chikungunya, which is on rise. We have four serotypes of dengue, which are on rise. We have yellow fever, arbo virus, which is rare. We have rabies under control, rubella under control, measles under control, mums under control, Kasmur forest disease is still there in the forest. We have hepatitis B and C under control. We have herpes simplex and zoster. There is no testing. Where human papilloma virus, which is very common, adenoviruses causing conjunctivitis are common, 
rotaviruses, many strains are there. Enteric adenoviruses, many strains are there. Cox Saki virus A16 and enterovirus 17, which causes foot mouth to diseases in children, but specific testing is not done. Influenza virus specific testing is not done. HIV2 is there dominant, but other strains of HIV1 are rare. The testing data is not known. We have a large number of rhinoviruses causing common cold. At least 160 strains are there, but we don't test them. We, have, we had swine flu H1N1, but testing data is not known. Bird flu was there, but we do not have data. And COVID-19, we, so we have so far 10 variants have been found with Delta variant dominant. And there are many other rare viral diseases, systemic or affecting different parts of the body, but no testing data has been published. My rough, my rough estimate is we are in Goa, we have got exposed to at least 150 to 200 strains of different viruses. And with 10 strains of COVID-19 and Delta variant dominant now in the state, we know now what is the importance of this international seminar. And here is a list of 60 major bat viruses, which include rabies virus, Lagos bat virus, Duan J virus, Australian bat Lisa virus, European bat Lisa virus, Aravan virus, Kujand virus, Irput virus, West Caucasian bat virus, Gosas virus, Can Canyon virus, Mount Ilgon bat virus, Oita 296 virus, Indra virus, then we have Mapuera virus, Menengal virus, Theoman virus. Most interestingly, Nipah virus they found is hosted by variable flying fox, large flying fox, Lial's flying fox, and chikungunya virus they found it is hosted by Sundeval's leaf nose bat and little pre tailed bat. Then we have Sinbis virus, Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus, Bukalasa bat virus, Kerry Island virus, Dakar bat, Entebbe bat virus. They also did research on Japanese encephalitis virus, and interestingly, they found it in Formosan leaf nose bat, Great Round Leaf bat, Schreber's long fingered bat, and Little Japanese horseshoe bat. They also interestingly found Kasnur forest disease virus, which we thought tick bone virus, it is an arbory virus in a rufous horseshoe bat, as well as great short nose fruit bat. To conclude, this is a big list of, but it is a very interesting list and we must research on these and see what is present, what is absent, and in the uh, adjoining region, Western Ghats, and also in Southeast Asia. It's very important that such an international seminar is contributing towards this effort. We have Jugra virus, Montana myotis, Lycos encephalitis virus, Nompen bat virus, Rio Brevo virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus, Saboya virus, Sukuluk virus, Kamana bat virus, Uganda S virus, Yukosi virus, Katu virus, Guama virus, Nepoyo virus, Antan virus, Rift Valley fever virus, Noskana virus, Kain Khoi virus, Bangui virus, Ifi virus, Japanot virus, Fomidi virus, Nelson Bay virus, Kula virus, Broom virus, Agua Prita virus, A cytomegalovirus, Periksha virus, Juruaka virus, Isik Kul or Ketera virus, Mojuidos Campos virus, Yugi virus, and last but not the least, Kasukero virus. This is a list of 60 major bat viruses. Their names indicate tremendous amount of field research, ecological research, molecular research. We salute these bat researchers today on this occasion. And with this, I end up my remarks with best of the greetings for the seminar to succeed and good uh, discussion to be generated. And thank you very much, uh, the organizers and Goa State Biodiversity Board and participants for listening to this presentation with rapt attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamath, for those well researched and comprehensive opening remarks. May you continue to inspire and guide us. May you have good health. And uh, thank you so much for uh, your opening remarks. Uh, we recognize the presence of Dr. Suresh Kunkalyankar and welcome him in this webinar. Dr. Kunkalyankar will speak at the end of this technical session with his closing remarks. And uh, now we begin uh, with the technical session, one of today's international webinar, and the first invited speaker is uh, Dr. Chermala Srinivasu, who's already joined us. Uh, let me, allow me to uh, highlight some of his accomplishments and a very erudite uh, academic profile. Uh, Dr. Srinivasu is currently the Associate Professor at the Department of Zoology of Osman University. He's a research head of the Wildlife Biology and Taxonomic Lab. Uh, and also the curator of the Natural History Museum with the Osmania University. He has an additional responsibility as a director of the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation Studies of the same university. Uh, Dr. Srinivasu is a fellow of the prestigious Linnean Society of London, as also a fellow of the Zoological Society of London. He was awarded his PhD degree in the year 2000 from Osmania University, had a CSIR postdoc fellowship between 2002 and 2005, 
Uh, he was a scientist D at the School of Environmental Sciences uh, at the University of Delhi. And from June 2017 date, he's been with the Department of Zoology as a faculty member at the Osmani University. Um, a naturalist, a tetrapod biologist, and a taxonomist, as he would like to describe himself. Dr. Srinivasula has conducted research in most parts of Indian Peninsula, as also Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Besides, of course, his uh, academic and research visits to Denmark, United Kingdom, and the Philippines. He has executed five major research projects, all pertaining to bat biology, uh, successfully uh, obtained funding and grants and the Indo-United Kingdom collaborative research projects, twice, once in 2014 and once in 2017. He has seven research scholars who completed their doctoral research under his uh, erudite guidance and many more who are being guided and mentored for the PhD thesis. Uh, 155 research papers in peer-reviewed international and national journals are reputed. 132 online resources on IUCN Red List database, 12 books, including Springer's and CRC Press, United States of America, highest impact factor of 41.02 in Science Journal, H index of 17 and citation index of 2812, Dr. Chelmala Srinivasulu is a member of 16 academic and professional bodies of national and international repute, an expert member of the Telangana State Biodiversity Board, Government of Telangana, very importantly. Notably, he is an IUCN Regional Red List Authority for South Asian Bats, and very importantly, again, a member of the IUCN's Species Survival Commission and member of several specialist groups not only bat specialist group, but he's also a member of the viper specialist group, amphibian specialist group, and that, that's therefore uh, the right description of the man as a tetrapod biologist, is also on the conservation planning specialist group. With this illustrious track record, it's a pleasure and a privilege for us to have Dr. Chelmana Srinivasulu from the University of Osmania. We welcome you, Dr. Srinivasulu, for your interesting presentation. And we look forward to have you join this uh, technical session. The floor is open for you. Dr. Thank, you very much. Thank, Thank you very much, Dr. Manoj Borka. Uh, and all the organizing committee members, uh, especially uh, Ms. Pratiksha, uh, who had visited Osmania University and uh, happened to you know, undergo the training on bat uh, studies, etc. cetera. Uh, I am really pleased and humbled that uh, the uh, college has you know chosen me to share my views and share my uh, experience working on bats and that too in the context of zoonosis and why bat studies become important and what are the major challenges that we face uh, we have also heard dr nandurkar uh, speaking about you know very uh, you know uh, quickly in, in 15 minutes time he has wonderfully you know covered the whole aspect of uh, what bats are and what uh, viruses have been reported from bats etc and that makes my talk a little bit easier because you have been already told about you know what the names of the bats the viruses uh, virus names etc etc so it would be a kind of you know smooth talk for me uh, after having listened to to him uh, before. So I'll just start my presentation and I'll just want confirmation from you all or any one of you whether or not you can see my presentation. Are you able to see so? Uh, not as yet, doctor. It's uh, been, it's been, yes, now it's, it's visible. Thank you so much. It's, it's visible. So I'll, I'll just keep it like this. So it's it's okay, right? So shall I go ahead with uh, the yes, presentation? Sir, yes, yeah. yes, sir, thank you, please. thank you, thank you for confirming. So thank you very much once again for uh, that wonderful you know introduction that you have given about me, and uh, uh, I I I I'm, I just want to you know define myself. Although uh, I teach zoology and do research in wildlife and taxonomy, I'm interested in many uh, things. But uh, bats are something that has given me recognition and bats are something that has, you know, I always say that has ensured that I get my uh, food on my plate. Uh, not only just literally, but also, you know, like, yes, 
if we do not have bats, the ecosystem gets uh, affected. And uh, maybe in the talk, I would be able to you know connect the dots and tell you why uh, we do bat research. It's not just I, but uh, many of uh, the uh, you know participants or uh, might be knowing that you know uh, my wife as well as my son. Uh, we are the whole of the family is involved in bat research. So, uh, so that's a passion and love uh, that we have about bats. So, in this particular uh, you know uh, talk, I'm going to just take you to the wonderful world of bats uh, and then understand what exactly these organisms are and uh, what are uh, you know uh, with respect to IUCN status what is what are the status how many bats are under pressure or, or under threat of extinction etc and then we'll get into zoonosis and try to understand the broad categories of zoonosis and then try to connect the bats with viral zoonosis and then we see that you know how these things impact us and then finally we'll be open for uh, question answers so as uh, uh, earlier speaker has already mentioned about you know what exactly bats are we have to remember that you know the bats as such are a very very important group of organisms and they contribute to as much as a quarter of known mammalian diversity and there are more than 1435 species of bats that are known throughout the world new species of bats are being discovered described and the latest one that you can see here is Myotis nimbiensis that has been, you know, very recently uh, reported from West Africa, from the Nimba Mountains. Uh, in fact, uh, surprises, surprises, new species of bats have been also discovered and reported from India, especially from Northeast India. So if we have to, you know, look at the South Asia as such or the region as such then we know that there are as many as 147 species of bats that have been reported from uh, south asian countries and uh, in india we have as many as 131 species of bats when we began the bat research way back uh, 20 22 years back then we had a number that was about 101 onwards and uh, people started working more and more and we uh, started, uh, you know, discovering more uh, species that were hitherto unreported from Indian uh, boundaries, or new species have been discovered and reported to new to science. So, as we have already known, that you know, bats are divided into two major groups: the megachiropterans and the microchiropterans, or in simple parlance, we can call them as megabats, fruit bats. Of flying foxes in uh, those belong to megacharopterans and then the microcharopterans are simply called as microbats or insect eating bats or insectivorous bats and uh, what we have to remember is the megabats are basically old world bats uh, whereas microbats are found throughout uh, the world excepting the extreme you know condition areas like arctic and arctic region and antarctic region now the uh, differentiation between the two bats uh, bat groups major bat groups is like you know one uh, of them is like mega mega bats they are fewer in number uh, and uh, they feed on fruits they feed on leaves they feed on nectar they feed on pollen uh, etc whereas there are some exceptions of you know mega bats feeding something else other than these uh, while we come to micro bats although we call them collectively as insect bats, they are also, you know, diversified with respect to their uh, uh, diet. Uh, you have some microbats or some representative species of microbats that would be, you know, uh, feeding on pollens, etc. And uh, we also have very diverse feeding behavior among the microbats. Uh, among that, we can see that, you know, the diverse, the diverse uh, feeding niches or dietary niche would be uh, spanning from being an insectivore to being carnivore to being piscivore or uh, to being you know uh, sanguivore or blood feeding uh, uh, you know uh, behavior so such kind of you know variety of feeding uh, uh, you know niches can be seen among the bats and then bats also vary in size and there is like, you know, we have the very small bats, micro bat among the micro bats. We have bumblebee bat or kitties, uh, bumblebee bat. So kitties hognose uh, bat is the smallest bat. 
which uh, has a wingspan. We are not talking about the uh, body length, but we are talking about the wingspan from end of the uh, uh, wingtip to another end of the wingtip. You, it is six inches in its wingspan, but uh, from that small size to the largest one that would have go up to six feet. Uh, and those are the Acidodon jubators, that is giant golden crowned flying fox. Uh, both of them, both, both these extremities, you can see that, you know, among the bat size are found in Southeast Asia. Uh, when we come to uh, South Asia and try to see that, you know, the, uh, the distribution of bats, then we see that, you know, uh, scientifically nowadays we are classifying bats into instead of all you know classifying them as suborder megachiroptera and suborder microchiroptera nowadays we uh, basing on the genetic studies and all we found that you know the uh, families that have been you know assigned to microchiroptera also belong to uh, uh, you know they are genetically closer to uh, megacharopterans or pteropodids. So that way there is a kind of, you know, change in classification that uh, recently we have started to accept. And this change uh, uh, brings in a new uh, set of suborders that is Yinteropteroptera and Yangocharoptera. So in the Yinteropteroptera, we have uh, in South Asia, uh, as many as, uh, uh, you know, 13 species of pteropodid uh, uh, represented. Uh, and uh, three species of rhinoformatids, then two species of megadermatids, then one species of rhinonicteridae, and then 16 species of hypocytrids, and 21 species of rhinolophids. Whereas when you go to Yangokairoptera and look at the diversity there, we have six species of sheep tail bats, those are embalonurids, we have four species of molossids, tomb bats, we have four species of miniotidids and we have as many as 77 species of evening bats or vespertilionids. So that's this uh, kind of you know, graph very clearly tells us about the world diversity versus the diversity of bats that we see in, uh, in the uh, region, in the South Asian region. And this, this uh, uh, reflects uh, uh, the uh, diversity of bats in India. If we pay attention, then as we have seen, as much as 52% of the bat diversity within India has been uh, contributed by evening bats and rest of the family's distribution, you can see for uh, the most abundant being evening bats followed by uh, your, uh, you know, uh, horseshoe bats followed by uh, leaf nose bats. So that's the diversity. And then you see among the fruit bats, we have 9% diversity. So, uh, so this is a map that shows us about, you know, the distribution uh, of the bats throughout India. Uh, this is not in terms of uh, number of sightings, or this is not in terms of, you know, uh, this is with terms of number of locations from which each species has been found. So then we can see that there are some kind of, you know, hotspots uh, all along the Western Ghats. And we also see the hotspots all along the Himalayas, especially the lower Himalayas. And if you ask me generally, if at all I have to, you know, study bats and where should I go and study bats, then I would say if you are in peninsular India, then rush to Western Ghats. And if you are in other parts of the India, then rush to uh, Himalayas. If not, then if you are wanting to find out where exactly you have in the Himalayas or in the Western Ghats you have to focus, then I can say that you know, Darjeeling and its vicinity is the hottest spot with respect to bat diversity, followed by uh, Meghalaya. Uh, if you see, pay attention, you can see that you know those are the two hotspots that you can see. But when you come to Western Ghats, you can see the Southern Western Ghats uh, being densely populated uh, by bat diversity. And then you also see in the central Western Ghats. In fact, this is the place where you are all located uh, in and around the Goa region. You have good bat diversity and then you also have good bat diversity reported historically, of course, in, in and around Mumbai, Pune, etc. So that's, that's how we look at the bat diversity or bat distribution. And uh, this work is being worked out and we are trying to refine the information about you know the current day distribution of bats so 
among the bats the interesting part is like you know we want to understand what is the percentage of species that are truly kind of you know restricted in their range within the re region so if we look at the endemic bat diversity then we see that you know india as 10.93 almost about 11% of the endemic diversity that is known from the a uh, uh, region and then it is followed by sri lanka and then followed by nepal so but there are some bats that would occur more in more than one country and if we are looking at that diversity we see that there are about nine such bat species that are endemic to south asia and they are not found in anywhere else whereas if you look at india we have 14 such species that are known only from india nowhere else and nepal has one such species and sri lanka has one such species so when we start to understand what is the conservation status then we see that you know as many as eight species that is 5.63% of uh, you know the bat diversity that we have the species diversity that we have that are listed under iucn threatened category and among the iucn threatened category i see that there are uh, only uh you know critically endangered bats or endangered bats or vulnerable bats and uh, the critic among the cl critically endangered bat there is only one species uh, polar leaf nose bat hypocedrus hypophilus which is known from only single location in polar district of karnataka and then followed by you know three species of endangered uh, bats those are latidens salimari tiropus fonulus and rhinolophus pognatus now latidan salimali is endemic to the southern western ghats found in the western ghat regions of tamil nadu and uh, kerala and uh, uh, tiropus fonulus is found uh, endemic to nicobar islands and rhinolophus cognatus is found on the andaman islands and there are some reports that are coming from uh, you know the few of the northern uh, nicobar islands too then uh, among the vulnerable bats we have about four species Uh, of which tiropus melanotus occurs uh, on the on the andaman and nicobar islands then we have hypocedrus durgadasi which was earlier known to be you know occurring only from or known from jabalpur and its vicinity but we have discovered it from many uh, different locations uh, it was also doubted we were uh, we did not do anything new but it was like also doubted about 100 years back that you know it might be widespread uh because of lack of you know scientific evidence and all such kind of things uh it was not reported widespread but we have found out that you know the, this species not only occurs in the jabalpur and its vicinity but also occurs in uttar pradesh in in uh, bihar as well as if you come down uh, to the south uh, we also know that this species occurs uh, in tamil nadu karnataka and andhra pradesh and other regions then we uh, have uh, myotis pilosus and myotis cicarius which are like again restricted in the uh, western ghats uh, sorry uh, himalayas and uh, in the hindu the himalayas these species occur and then we have one species of near threatened species which is silops triti silops triti although because it is near threatened all, uh, although we have couple of you know historic records of occurrence of silops triti in in india as well as in bangladesh but most of the silops triti uh, we know from southeast asian countries so because of you know the uh, widespread distribution and all those things globally it has been recognized as near threatened species so ens in uh, south asia also we recognize it as near threatened species but if you look at india then uh, i i am yet to find out any new records of silops triti being reported from india all the silops triti records that we know are historic in nature and another important thing that uh, when we start working on bats or get interested in any group of animals it uh, i always suggest my students my researchers or people come to who come to me to start their research i say that pay attention towards data deficient uh, organisms because data deficient organisms are those organisms for whom we do not know anything excepting the fact that they have been discovered somebody has named it and we know only those uh, information so it becomes a bigger challenge for researchers future researchers that you know if you can work on these things and contribute more about the ecology biology of these or distribution information about these 
organisms, it would be great. Uh, although, if you if you pay attention, the second name, Automops rotony. Many of you from Goa might be knowing about Automops rotony because you share the you know the Automops rotony range with Karnataka, Northern Karnataka, and uh, uh, you you see that you know although we know. And uh, there are confirmed reports of Automops rotony from Siju Cave in Meghalaya. And also there was an unconfirmed uh, report which got, you know, described as a new species from Southeast Asia. We still consider it as a data deficient species because we do not know many things about Automops uh, rotony. Uh, we also have to, you know, confirm and get to uh, kind of you know accept the reality that you know there is a population one population here in goa border and another population way up over there in northeast india in the siju cave are they the same species that's the biggest question as a taxonomist i i always ask these questions it, there's a, so much of you know geographical isolation if at all automobile strotony was occurring in between that biologist or scientist might have you know detected them but unfortunately so far we have not got the information so basing on that the kind of you know intuition we start thinking that whether or not both the automobs are the same species or not so that's the reason why it is uh, you know uh, listed as data deficient so there are many species that are data deficient in india where we are working on some of the species that you can see here and uh, some species we are not able to find information there are other groups of bad biologists who are working on that but it is generally just for the sake of understanding that there are many species if you are interested to take up bat studies in future there are many species awaiting your attention uh, to work on and then you can you know contribute new knowledge about these species now bats are under great threat i am speaking on this forum as a bat biologist first and then i will be you know bringing in the perspective of zoonosis later they are under great stress one of the most important aspect that bats are facing is the human apathy especially in developing countries and especially in a country like india bats are not good omen that's what it, they are now also, even even now after after the COVID uh, you know nineteen uh, uh, pandemic situation, it, uh, we still get calls because of bats. Uh, if bats are entering homes, bats are good or not? Bats are carriers of virus or not? This that and all such kind of things. But now also we have seen that you know the uh, the interest for or the 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 uh, thirst for knowing about bats has increased among the society because of COVID-19 pandemic because some of us believe that you know the virus that has infected us comes from bat. So uh, it, it, it has uh, the COVID-19 pandemic situation has of course increased the attention of common man towards the bat but the apathy did not decrease. Now we look at bats even in a you know, even in a greater negative perspective. So that is something which is bothering many of the bat biologists like us. And we wanted to clarify the situation and say that, okay, they are good. They are carriers of virus as all the other organisms are. There is no doubt about, you know, bats being, you know, better carrier of the virus. When I say zoologically better carrier, they are good. Right, they they have been naturally selected to uh, have virus in their body, right? So, but they are not as infectious as one thinks about. We get so many, uh, you know, deaths happening because of rabid, rabid dog bites compared to uh, rabid bat bites. Although we know that dogs and bats, if you are trying to compare, we will come across lots of rabid bats or bats that have rabies virus in them uh, when you compare with your dogs so so the the, the kind the, the the knowledge that one needs to have the information that one needs to have is that okay they are good reservoirs they are natural reservoirs and they are healthy reservoirs and the virus jumped to human beings because of other reasons it's not because Bats are interested to transfer the virus to us. So that is what 
one needs to understand. And why am I speaking about these things when I'm talking about threats to bats in South Asia? This is the biggest threat that we have seen. We have realized that negative perception about bats, because when you feel bad or you do not have good opinion about any group of organisms, you try to harm or you try to, you know, have even, even, you know, more negative impression about those groups of organisms. Besides this, we have, you know, habitat loss. We have uh, indiscriminate usage of insecticides, pesticides, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, in our day-to-day, -day, you know, agriculture activity. We also have seen. In fact, it has increased uh, after the COVID-19 situation uh, in India. In many parts of India, we have seen that you know the roosting trees have been destroyed. It has been burned. It has been fell. And uh, then we also see that you know there's a lot of disturbance that is happening in case of uh, you know tourism-related activities. Uh, Fifty years back, sixty years back, when uh, you know. And bad biologists were working. Brosset was working in Ajanta Elora caves, and uh, he was documenting the bad diversity in these old, uh, you know, caves uh, and uh, temple ruins and all those things. He reported wonderful bad diversity. When we started our research, we saw wonderful bad diversity. But now, 20 years, 25 years down, uh, you know, uh, we see that all these caves have been, you know, uh, restored. And uh, lots of light, lots of, uh, you know, uh, in fact, uh, ACs in some caves I have seen, in some cave temples we have seen, you know, they have put up air conditioners too. Uh, lights are there. And the whole of the cave ecosystem has changed because of tourism related activities and the bats have been uh, you know, uh, extirpated locally in that those caves. Today, if I, we go to these uh, caves where uh, you know, Brossett has written or Bates has written in 80s, uh, 90s, uh, yeah, late 80s, when he studied once again, then he said that, you know, uh, a kind of, you know, very respectable numbers of bats uh, can be seen of these many species. But when we go and survey there, we don't find them. And that is one of the biggest, biggest challenges that we have seen that, you know, bat roosts are disturbed. And bats are also naturally at this uh, local sustenance level and uh, for medical uh, purposes or medicinal purposes, they are, you know, harvested, they are hunted and they are consumed locally. Now, one of the biggest thing that has triggered the interest of people, not only scientists, but also people in general about bats is the you know, start or initiation of the SARS uh, or SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. I say SARS because in 2002, 2004, when the first detection happened and when we got to know about, you know, the, uh, what do you say, the relationship between the infecting virus gene and uh, the bad coronavirus gene being 96% similar, then we started blaming bats and then the link started right from there. And then we started rolling on into getting the infection called MERS. Again, we blamed bats and then later realized that there was an intermediary host in which the uh, virus changed itself and then became infectious and then jumped to from the infectory, uh, intermediary host to human beings. And then the same thing happened now in COVID-19. We still bl blame bats, but yet we have to prove. We have to find out that, you know, uh, the host, the real host from where it has jumped. Although some of the studies, uh, you know, tell us or indicates that, you know, pangolins might be the intermediary host, but the looking at the structure of the gene, which I, of course, uh, the next speaker is going to, you know, describe about all those things. I, I, I personally believe that it, it, it has more of a kind of, you know, chimeric nature. Uh, this is my personal opinion. I'm not a virologist, but looking at all these studies, I feel that it has more of a, uh, you know, chimeric nature that uh, shows that the capability of virus to mutate and become more successful uh, organism or more successful uh, entity to continue its uh, presence in the uh, yeah, 
in the in the organisms that it wants to continue to live so the idea about bats being reservoirs although scientifically had been knowing uh, being known for quite a long time but the interest increased post uh, you know sars infection the first infection that uh, the world has witnessed and then more and more research monies were put on this particular aspect and that has led to more and more works being done on the uh, bats and viruses as such and if you start paying attention towards all the research that has happened on bat viruses and all these things you will see that it is concentrated in the southeast asia especially southern china and other regions like that and that kind of tells us about you know why uh, at the same time other countries were not paying attention because of their own kind of you know priorities and all such kind of things but uh, other uh, in other areas in other countries such kind of you know what you say uh, transmission of viral diseases from bats to human beings were not happening so rampantly or so quickly uh, as we see in case of southeast asia and southern china uh, as an example so that is what has kind of you know created more and more interest these days in the past almost about 10 to 15 years we have seen lots of money being pumped in especially in those countries to find out uh, the uh, viral loads and viral diversity in among the bat populations in those countries to to understand what exactly is there whereas for the matter of fact in fact many a times on many different fora i say that you know government of india should have done that we are already have you know niv sitting in pune and we already have this sampling annual sampling happening and all such kind of things but we focus on certain things that are very important and we are looking on these things when last year niv reported that you know the corona bat corona virus has been found in indian bats uh, people came to me and asked uh, what is your opinion i said i am not surprised i'm not surprised i'm surprised with the fact that they have just found out from two species of bats and i am wanting to tell them there are 131 species of bats so the monitoring the surveillance the you know uh, studies are limited because of many reasons we, we will not go into that but presently it becomes important for us to understand the uh, the role of bats in the environment in the ecosystem as natural reservoirs for multitude of you know strains of viruses and multitude species of viruses belonging to multitude gen genera of virus so they are, they are natural reservoirs and from them we have to learn about how we can you know contain uh, and how we can produce uh, the mechanisms by means of which we can you know control the infectious or infection levels within human populations so that is what the importance of bats would be from uh, my perspective so now we see that you know when we are talking about zoonotic diseases or zoonoses although we understand that you know zoonotic diseases many of us when i ask my students they say that okay sir zoonotic diseases are the diseases that come from you uh, animals to human beings but uh, the uh, correct definition is it swings either way it it goes from this way to that way and uh, if you have had paid attention that as soon as the uh, covid-19 was uh, you know declared as a pandemic and most of the bat biologists throughout the world we have taken a decision that we are going to stop working on bats now not for the fear of getting infected but for the fear that if covid-19 is in my body and if it gets into the bats body it would mutate itself and create a new virus we don't know how it is going to and, and that's the reason why if you have you know paid attention towards scientific uh, you know responses and scientific feelings as uh, sorry not the feeling scientific opinion that had been you know put forth by many scientists throughout the world they said that you know curtail your interactions with wild animals curtail your interactions with domesticated animals we do not know how we are going to transmit this virus from our body because many of us are the asymptomatic carriers and we do not know how we are going to you know transmit to the other body, uh, organisms and the virus gets chance of mutating and becoming something else 
so we that is the reason why it becomes more and more important for us to understand the reality behind how these zoonotic organisms or positive organisms of zoonotic diseases act function and once we understand all these things then it would be easier for us to you know curtail uh, and control uh, the the spread of these uh, uh, diseases we do that there are more than 200 diseases that are you know because of animal reasons the parasites the uh, fungi the uh, bacteria the virus that are you know problematic or that are positive of various kind of diseases to human beings uh, almost about more than 200 kind of diseases have been known that comes from the animal origin so not only this we also are aware of the fact that these diseases are capable of not only being transmitted from animals to human beings but from human beings to animals too so lots and lots of you know evidence is all around us which suggests that the zoonotic diseases or zoonosis as such should be understood as animal diseases or disease of of humans transmitted from animals by means of a vector or a contact and this also talks about something that you have to pay attention towards is the direction of transmission it could be either from animal to human beings or human beings to animal so the 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 context uh, is increasing now when we are talking about you know zoonosis or zoonotic diseases it increase it is increasing and that as i told you was the only reason why many of the wildlife biologists have stopped themselves directly working with the animals directly handling animals be it bats be it snakes be it any other animals we do not know what is going to happen when we are aware that almost about 60% or 60 to 70% of the human population has been infected by covid-19 virus and many of us of this infected group many of us are asymptomatic carrier of this particular virus if you go and interact with wild animal or domesticated animal you don't know how you are going to you know that's the reason why today also we are told that if you are in close contact in close rooms with many people or you have to maintain you have to maintain that covid appropriate behavior why are they asking us all although we have taken you know vaccination and all such kind of things still government still scientists still virologists still you know bad biologists everybody is asking us to follow the covid appropriate behavior it is only for the reason that we know that we can be causing harm to not only other human beings but also to other living organisms so as i was just saying that you know we have the zoonotic diseases that have been categorized into these four categories major categories those are the zoonotic diseases that are caused by virus to the zoonotic diseases that are caused by bacteria zoonotic diseases that are caused by fungi and zoonotic diseases that are caused by parasites now bats can or bats directly or indirectly can be responsible for zoonotic diseases coming from all these things when whenever we used to enter any cave full of bats and all those things i used to always work you know be careful about not only the virus or the, you know the bacteria that could come out of the bats when we are handling bats saliva bats you know body fluids etc but also the fungal spores that are there in the guano or the parasites that are there in the guano the, uh, the mites right all those things that might be you know biting us and giving us uh, transmitting some kind of you know foreign uh, living material into our body and then it might be a problem problem for us so what was the answer take precaution so what i am trying to tell you is bats or any groups of organisms if we are in close contact with them they would be reasons for all the kind of zoonotic diseases that we see if at all they are not the host of that particular virus bacteria 
fungi or any kind of parasite also their ecosystem in which they are living might be the source from where it might be coming so you have to be very careful but uh, the 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 diseases that come because of you know the bacteria fungi parasite by uh, parasitic infection uh, all those things are little less and not many people had been paying attention towards these things but most of the time when we are talking about bats we focus on the viral diseases or viral loads among the bats so bats and virus if we start looking at it carefully then we have detected more than 200 virus that comes from bats and they are in bats more than 200 uh, different types of you know virus and uh, as many as 27 families of viruses have been detected from bats so we see a, um, among these we know that 11 families of bats and 37 genera of bats and the species belonging to these 37 different genera are have these bat viruses that had been detected so far it's not that the other species that have not been you know reported to have bat virus in them do not have bat virus we are yet to detect them we are yet to you know classify understand them and classify them so as dr uh, uh, you know uh, nandurkar was talking about we see that there is a lot of diversity with respect to the virus uh, that we see among uh, the bats and the virus could be a dna material rna material and all such kind of variability that was there uh, in the virus that has led to the diversity that we see among the bat uh, you know uh, viruses that are found in the bats now uh, yeah for the yeah it's already 614 so now what we have to understand is I will just very quickly go through different groups of, you know, virus that uh, cause different types of diseases. I, I, I will just show you and then I will also show you in the slide the names of the species that are, uh, you know, hosting these virus. Like, you know, in this slide, we are learning about adenoviridae or zoonosis that are caused by adenovirus belonging to the genus Mastadenovirus. And there are at least three viruses that has been detected by name Raiku, Bat Adenovirus 2 and Bat ADV4. These are coming from these three host species like Raiku Flying Fox, Common Pipistrel and Lesnol's Rosette. Now Lesnol's Rosette is a species that occurs in India too. So I am just indicating that there is a possibility that if we you know, do studies on the Rosetas uh, uh, that are found, the Rosetas lesnolti found in India, there are chances that we can find that ADV4 or uh, another virus strain or species that is closer to bat ADV4. Then we have Arena VDD in which we have Takaribe, which is found in at RTBS Simakensis, which is not found in India. Then we have Mamastoro virus and uh, in this we have many species that have been detected and they come from many different genera and species of bats and then in Borna virus groups we have an unnamed uh, bat Borna virus B1 uh, in the unnamed genus which is being worked on which was found in common pipistrel in India the pipistrelis pipistrelis is very very restricted in its distribution into the north and western regions a very few uh, species reports uh, have been known. Then Orthobunia virus, we have Kartu, Goma, Nepio, and all these things. If you pay attention, then you have only one species uh, in India, which is uh, like, you know, uh, Caraphon uh, plicatus. Again, Caraphon plicatus is uh, uh, distributed uh, locally and patchily. Not many uh, sightings of Caraphon plicatus have been reported in India. Whereas it is wonderfully, uh, you know, easy to find. Uh, I would, yeah, easy to find in Sri Lanka rather than in India. Then you have hunter virus. Among that, we have Araquara, then Hantan, Hongpai, and all these are the different viruses that are 
found that were found in these different bat species of which horseshoe bats like Rhinolophus affinis, Rhinolophus sinicus occurs in India and then Hippocitrus gentilis occurs in Northeast India. Pipistrellus abramus, very few records, only three, two historic record and one new record from India. Rest of the bat species are not found here in India. Then flabovirus, in the flabovirus we have uh, three species that uh, are known and Pipistrellus coli is something which is very interesting species. It is mostly northwestern species. It is found in good numbers in uh, Afghanistan, a few localities in Pakistan, but we also have few unconfirmed localities from India, especially from Maharashtra also, there are a couple of records of Pipistrellus coli. And again, the last uh, uh, you know, virus type called Malsur is found in Rhino uh, Rositas lesnoltii. Nayaro virus, we have uh, these many species among which the free-tailed bats are host for Gosas virus and then Egyptian uh, rosite, which is also recorded from Pakistan and few localities in northwest India uh, are the host for Yogui and Kasokereo uh, thing. Uh, interestingly here, we have the lesser Asiatic yellow bat, house bat and lesser Asiatic yellow bat, house bat, Spotophilus coli is host for Ketera. So the Ketera virus uh, is also uh, detected in this. And uh, believe me, in India, nobody has you know, done the uh, screening of Spotophilus coli or Spotophilus. Uh, so Sapo virus uh, 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 belongs to this Cal Calici viridi uh, family and bat Sapo virus from Epositrus gentilis, especially from Southeast Asia. And then Serpo virus, there are many species of virus found uh, from this particular genus and many different uh, bat species are the host. And then you have cyclovirus, especially the cyclovirus uh, uh, has been found in the Mexican three-tailed bat. Then you have alpha, this is the group that interests many of us, the coronavirus. And in the coronavirus, if you see, uh, there are two genus and one genus is called as alpha coronavirus. Of the alpha coronavirus, you have human coronavirus, which was first detected in Hippocytus kaffir. It was also detected in Minioteris pusillus and uh, there is another alpha coronavirus called as novel virus, novel virus and this novel virus was uh, detected in Mr. Sina tuberculata. Uh, the coronavirus that is of concern to human beings that causes epidemic and pandemic like situation that we are presently undergoing comes from the beta coronavirus and three such species have been detected so far. Uh, SARS coronavirus, which was found in Rhinolophus sinicus, although old records will tell you that it is Rhinolophus affinis, but it is sinicus. And then MERS coronavirus from Tathosaurus perforatus and uh, SARS coronavirus too from Sinicus once again, but again, it would be a question mark because we are yet to find out from which bat. It is a 96% similarity between SARS coronavirus that has been detected in human beings to that of our uh, Rhinolophus affinis first coronavirus that we have seen. So uh, we have a uh, a, a, you know, corona, a, a virus that is called as Paris disease uh, virus, and this has been de detected in common pepistrel, and this was uh, in France. Uh, they have detected it, and uh, then you have flavivirus groups, a uh, very large group, uh, wherein you can see that there are so many different, you know, uh, virus that has been detected and uh, species that is, or virus that is of interest to Indians is Kaisanur Forest disease virus. And Kaisanur KFD virus is uh, first, it was first detected in Rhinolophus ruii and later a few more species have been reported, but it is not yet, uh, you know, uh, out uh, officially as such. And then among the flavivirus, you also have so many, as I told you, many different uh, species uh, have, uh, is known. And uh, if you have paid attention while you were going through both the slides, you will see that uh, there is a species called lesser short-nosed fruit bat, Sinopteris brachiotis. Sinopteris brachiotis also occurs in India. 
and we also have je you know uh, virus japanese encephalitis and again it has been detected in rosita slesnolti so such is the diversity of you know flavivirus so many species of bats might be harboring flavivirus uh, you know species then among the filoviridae you have marburg virus and marburg virus uh, was first detected in egyptiacus uh, rosita egyptiacus then you have ebola virus which was uh, detected in hammer headed fruit bat and then you also have qv virus which was detected in ipomops uh, species myonectris species and miniotris tribersi miniotris is uh, one genus that is also known from india there are four species of miniotris that are reported from india and scribersi for the time being we do not uh, uh, consider scribersi as occurring in india because the subspecies phylogenosis that was belonging to scribersi is recognized as a full species uh, by the recent taxonomy so we have ortho hepta virus uh, groups and in this we have hepatitis virus and hepatitis virus also were detected in many uh, you know at least three groups of uh, bat uh, species like euroderma hypocitrus and rhinolophus and uh, then we have hepaviridae in which the genus is not yet named but we have hepatitis e virus like uh, virus and it was detected in dextin uh myotis and then you have herpes viridi wherein we have parixa virus we have agua preta we have cytomegalovirus which all the species that we are looking at none of them are uh, found in south asia and then we have noda virus uh, and sars noda virus comes from the common serotin and the common serotin is a paleoarctic species that occurs marginally in south asia especially uh, you know more detected in afghanistan and northern pakistan and then in northern india then you have ortho mixoviridi which uh, causes influenza among the bats and then you have influenza virus a which is h17 n10 and only the influenza virus coming from these two different bats which are also not found in india then omega papillo uh, papillo papilloma virus again we have mrpv1 and uh, mspv1 which are found in myotis and miniotris cribersi once again one is neotropical the other one is the uh, you know paleoarctic species now hanipa virus is interesting now the hanipa virus i just you know uh, to just attract attention i have put hendra virus and nipa virus as uh, uh, yeah, red in color font color and the nipa virus has been re also reported from uh, india in kerala uh, a few years back and recently also we had the nipa virus uh, you know detection and uh, it was found in the tiropus hypomelanus and nipa virus was also found in rosetus and tiropus uh, gigantius which is now tiropus uh, uh, What's the species name? I'm forgetting that. Don't worry about it. Then you have Mobili virus, uh, which uh, harbors like you know uh, the common vampire bat uh, harbors this uh, canine distemper-like uh, virus, and then Rubella virus. Lots of diversity, and you also see that you know Rosita slesnolti is uh, one that has uh, a diversity of Tuhuko virus. and such diversity that uh, the scientists have named them as two hopo virus 1 2 3 1, so again and again what is what i am seeing is the rosetus and then pipistrels and then uh, maybe aptesicus in india are the group of organisms that we have to you know pay attention towards uh, if we have to start work on you know uh, bat viruses in india so pneumovirus in that you have these organisms again rosetus names appears here dependovirus boca virus and then you have one name pav4 uh, like virus and undetermined virus under the pavo virus and all of them belong to you know species that do not occur in india or south asia so pico burna virus uh, again an undetected species is uh, there uh, and that has been Uh, collected or detected from common pipistrel 
and then pogo virus uh, again it goes into mostly in into the african uh, you know continent and here we see that you know uh, e album idolon album pogo virus which was uh, uh, detected from the african straw colored fruit bat and then there are many species that are unclassified so far with respect to genus uh, among which we can see eio pico picorna virus and ms picorna virus once again these are all just you know abbreviated names of the uh, host species like when i say ra picorna virus it is rhinolophus affinis that we are talking about so uh in polyoma viridi you have an undetermined genus and there is a polyoma virus that has been de detected in myotis lucifugus which is from uh, north america then the, for poxiviridi you have podo poxivirini uh, which has been reported from idolon helvum and then you have aptici pox which is from aptisicus fuscus again a big brown bat from americas then orthorio virus then we have japanov uh, which is again uh, found in you know blossom bat which is, does not occur in india or south asia and uh, excepting the variable flying fox uh, which cause uh, host uh, polo uh, virus uh, which also occurs only in south east asia now unf unfortunately the indian uh, hypomelanus populations have not been screened yet and the indian hypomelanus populations occur on andaman and nicobar islands so rio viridi you have orbi virus which are found in nicteris nana and idolon helvum and then you have rota virus again idolon helvum and miss uh, uh, myotis mr sinus and aseliscus toliscanus so uh, aseliscus toliscanus occurs in india but historically known no new records have been there uh, it uh, is been reported from uh, afghanistan and pakistan recently but from india we are yet to find out so beta retrovirus we have endogenous group and it also occurs in many different species uh, of uh, you know bats and then spuma virus you have again it comes from rhinolophus affinis and rhinolophus affinis is found in india and then sirs gamma retrovirus and that is from the serotin aptisica serotinus so lisa virus is another big group amongst which the rabies uh, virus is also detected and the rabies virus uh, although we say that you know it is found out detected in many species of bats and all such kind of things but the main host that we have seen is the desmodus rotundus uh, and uh, all the textbooks medical textbooks teaches us about you know rabies virus being very commonly found in many groups of bat species so anyways that's that's the uh, knowledge that we are having but presently if you look at this particular list again we see that you know none of the species excepting micro uh, miniaturous cryberci which may be having you know the populations in india might be having that duen duen hodge uh, virus or uh, aptisicus serotinus which is again a pal paleoarctic species european bat lisa virus 1 might be possibly detected within india if at all uh, we do the surveillance etc so here the lisa virus uh, continues and we see that you know lots of species and lots of diversity is there and then this goes on like you know i i will now stop explaining it to you just i will just tell you that you know this is this is the diversity of you know the viruses that had been detected in many different bat host species as such so tota virus again many of these species are not been detected in india many of these species does not occur in india but indian bats need to be as we have you know discussed earlier and we have listened to the experts earlier indian bat surveillance needs to be done we have to find out what is the load viral load or viral uh, diversity virus diversity that our bats are uh, having in them and uh, how they could be you know problematic in future we have lots of uh, you know uh, artificial intelligence based uh, techniques and technologies that have been developed in the recent time that can tell us about the outbreak possibilities etc and how it can spread etc and we need to be prepared for that 
many a times when we are talking about viral diseases and all those things, we start thinking about uh, like, you know, many diseases that are, you know, emerging diseases, novel diseases and re-emerging diseases. So for, for such kind of, you know, situations for, for which human, human beings are not ready as such, we need to be very, very careful. We need to increase, uh, you know, more investigation. We need to do more studies to find out what exactly is the situation in India as such. And uh, we have to start working on that. We know that more than at least 75% of the emerging zoonotic diseases are coming from wildlife. And why are we getting so much of, you know, infections from wildlife? Either way, it is like, you know, either you are going and contacting the wild animals or the wild animals are contacting you this way or that way. If you are a human being who has very, you know, uh, white collar and stiff, uh, you know, neck, you will say, no, 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 we are not. Uh, animals are coming to us. Animals, you know, the leopards are getting in my village. It's not that. A few years back, your village was not there. Leopards were living there. So that is how we have to understand. Now, with the increasing human population, more and more, you know, Animal contacts, human animal contacts are increasing, and that is what is leading to all this scenario. And uh, it has been said that you know uh, any animal host becomes infectious, or the virus becomes virulent uh, in the individuals that are stressed, that are immunocompromised, and that is what we have to understand. The more I'm going to disturb the forest area, the more pressure I'm going to put on the forest area, the uh, organisms that are dwelling in those forest patches would be under stress and they would be, you know, in turn leading to the organisms, uh, pathogens or, you know, infectious organisms living in them becoming more infectious in nature. So at the end, what we have to realize is it is not that, you know, it is so easy that we have done that. In the past, SARS came, we blamed the bat. Uh, MERS came, we blamed the bat. Uh, SARS uh, COV2 uh, came, we blamed the bat. But it's it's not that. The bats are natural reservoirs that we have to know. Bats need to be understood. And then we need to, you know, because we know now that because of these things, the virus or any, any organism that could be, you know, infectious for human beings can jump from these reservoirs, natural reservoirs, get into intermediate flows, change their, you know, character and become more infectious and get, infect human beings. If we understand this flow, then we can start, you know, working positively to reduce the chances of getting such infections in future. If we can, if we keep doing this kind of, you know, uh, blame something else and don't say that, you know, I throw up your hands in the, um, Air and say that I'm I, I I'm okay I I did not do anything bad but this is because of somebody else this is because of some other organism especially it is you know easier for us to you know blame bad because people think that you know bats are bad it's not the case you have to remember that when the COVID started lots and lots of calls came to us and throughout the world we were under big stress as bat biologists thinking that. Lots of negative, you know, thoughts were getting into the human society about bats. And all of us, not only in India, not only in South Asia, throughout the world, all the bat biologists have taken the responsibility to create awareness, scientific-based awareness to say that you know, we do not have evidence to suggest that bats were directly responsible for all these diseases. It's not that the bat has come and bitten you and given you the infection. It's the other way around. You have to remember when, when people come and ask me that I say that, you know, for 22 years, 22 plus years, we had been working on bats. If bats were the reason we should have been, you know, infected first. It's not that. The bat bitten rabies led deaths for bat uh, experts, bat scientists and bat rehabilitators was like, you know, the very less, it's less than 0.01% throughout the world. 
So there are only two cases wherein we have found that bat led rabbit uh, has led to death of uh, you know bat re rehabilitators. It's so so we need to have correct information so that we can you know take things positively and be prepared for living in a world that is becoming more and more you know more and more of animal human interaction is happening and this is just to show that you know we can coexist and provided we behave properly we behave respectfully with the animals that we are sharing this earth with unless and until we do that this is where the conservation perspective comes in unless and until you and i reduce the human population and stop the way we treat other organisms and put pressure on uh, you know remaining habitats of uh, uh, patches of habitats that we have on earth this is going to be very bad and uh, at the end of the day we have seen that you know covid has very clearly uh, the, the hit on our heads with a knuckle and that was very very hard to show that you know uh, uh, nature doesn't spare anybody nature doesn't look at whether you are a uh, illiterate person or you are a phd holder you are a professor in university or you are pulling a rickshaw nothing nothing of our virus and for nature all of us are equal and we can go in one you know okay so that that that's something i'm sorry that you know because of passion and because of things that <laughs> i i took long time but uh, i'm open for question and answers if if at all we have any thank you dr chelmala srinivasulu can you hear me am i audible yeah yes yes uh, thank you so much dr srinivasulu particularly for uh, that interesting presentation on both the chiropterological and the zoonotic dimensions involving the bed diversity of asia and thank you particularly for highlighting the unfortunate demonization as all of us call it of bats and the conservation issues confronting the bats uh, all across their range uh, the session is now open for question and answers of course we also welcome dr arinjay banerjee who's already joined and with dr banerjee's permission if we could just take a couple of questions for dr chelmala shrinivasul i request my colleague karen raganza to please hand in the question and answers karen please okay. uh, good evening sir uh, am i audible yes you yes, Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, Dr. Chenmala. Uh, we have a few questions here for you. Uh, first question uh, we have from Dr. Parimal Chandra Ray. Uh, Sir, how have you quantified the threats on bats from pollution and chemical pesticides? Is there any specific bioaccumulative toxin that is responsible? No. These these are you know one thing that you have to pay attention towards is. the studies on bats itself is very limited that is one first thing and as far as this toxicology based works and all such kind of things they are limited nobody has kind of you know looked into that of you know bioaccumulation and all such kind of things they have been you know zoologists have been working on bioaccumulation and all such kind of things but they were working on animals that are easily available animals that are available in the market that you can buy and rear them they were not working on that nobody gets interested in bats first and second thing is if you are getting interested in bats then you have to go and collect them either in caves dungeons and places where you don't want to go or you have to work during the night time when every, you could have you know been happily sleeping in your bedroom right so that's 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 the limitation so i i would say that the, you know the uh responsibility of future zoologists is to look into these things these are the knowledge gaps that we are having that needs to be worked on and uh, future zoologists have to work on these aspects uh, thank you dr chermala uh, i'll just move on to the next question by dr manoj bolkar uh, he says that uh, currently some of his students are inventing and surveying bat roosts in urban spaces in goa Uh, however only teropus gigantus seems to be well adapted are these not affected by urban noise and disturbances yeah there uh, among the bats what we have seen is you know because of uh, hundreds of years at least if not hundreds of years at least for you know past 10000 years of our uh, settlement human beings settling down and all such kind of things we have seen that you know many bat species have become uh, habituated to 
human settlement areas and uh, we call them as synanthropic uh, species and among the commonest species tiropus medius which i'm recollecting now tiropus medius is the name of the tiropus giganteus now it is the accepted name so indian flying fox is one that has got lots of benefit by living uh, in the urban ecosystems uh, when i say this i am not uh, discounting the fact that tiropus uh, giganteus or medius also lives happily in the forested tracts also so many of the tiropus uh, species that we have studied in andaman and nicobar islands they live in the forest areas very few colonies we have seen next to the you know uh, villages and all such kind of things and we when we found out the colony was there even before the settlement came in so such such kind of situations are there so in the urban ecosystem if we are because tiropus uh, medius is large bat and you can detect them easily it it is easier to see in goa i i see that pipistrellus uh, um, salonicus would be common pipistrellus coromandra would be common scotophyllus heathi would be common and all these species are very happily living in the urban ecosystems thank you sir thank you so much thank you doctor um, there is another question by gina she asks um whether tick oriented studies in bats are happening or not how will it help to study the emerging zoonotic diseases the and tick back in tick bat interactions yeah yeah that's a interesting question in fact you know it is one of the challenging works uh, that uh, you know zo students of zoology can take up in fact i have asked one of my uh, you know uh, uh, scholars to do the work on uh, ticks when he was on andaman nicobar island there are very few studies on ticks uh, of bats in india and uh, it is open uh, for you know uh, future students to take up studies uh, and it is uh, a very challenging work in fact uh, if you are interested you can get in touch with uh, bat biologists like us uh, experts in your uh, state and also get in touch with you know zoological survey of india uh, you know entomologists who are experts in tick identification and all those things they will help you and you can start it's it's a very very uh, you know uh, untouched kind of you know subject very few papers very few people have worked in the past especially zsi scientists that i am aware of they have worked in the past after that nobody has worked i believe ranjan adwani was the one who did some work on ticks and bats in uh, rajasthan after that nobody has worked so it's it's a very uh, open area where you can work in thank you doctor uh, there is a question by dr dilekta dikosta who asks what makes bats shed a higher concentration of viruses when they are stressed any any organism for example i also have you know this cold virus in my body when does it appear you might have seen by your own behavior and your own self unless and until you have gone and interacted with somebody who already has a cold virus you say that i have interacted with all healthy people and all those things yet i have got cold flu how did it happen it's only because your human immunity has come down because of stress when that thing happens the virus gets a chance to you know your immunity comes down you are you are giving chance for pathogens to increase in your body and when they increase in your body they become virulent so that does the same thing that uh, you know happens in every living organism thank you sir i think there is one uh, one of part one of the participants who wants to maybe speak to you directly uh huh um he has raised his hand i uh, just uh, if with your permission can i unmute yeah, yeah please please i i know professor uh, satyanar uh, yeah yeah okay. yeah yeah yes uh, sir namaskar ah uh, good ah uh, good good evening uh, uh, shrim uh, shrinivas lo so, good evening sir Uh, actually i am very happy that you have done excellent uh, survey of the bats and i know that you, uh, your expertise is really very useful for all the wildlife biologists and also i at this moment i also thank uh, dr manoj who was actively participated in the national webinar organized by the madhya pradesh college and uh, actually not only the conservation problem for us 
you know that you might have heard that the man also avoided eating the fruits uh, because of this problem they their cat eat the uh, fruits and i think we have to also throw some light on the eating fruits uh, whether they transmit the uh, virus or not it should be highlighted because the public wants that awareness should be there that actually the eating of the fruits uh, plays a role in that and because we do not know the mode of transmission see this is the biggest challenge for us see mode of transmission we are still uh, doubtful it is very controversial so these are the things i want to know and only last one thing is that uh, i used to go daily for a walk and all for field studies in chennai urban area where we have the public parks like uh, shamala punga near the american council there we have the uh, 200 plus of the uh, fruit bats and the people uh, they, 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 we have the walkers they come they are very scared to go <laughs> under the tree and because the droppings are there they may transmit all those things and these are the people used to scare about this we have to make more and more of awareness of that and also in the one other thing is that in the museum camp the madras museum we have 500 plus of the fruit bats see like that we have the lot of conservation problems now the man has scared about the bat you are rightly point out and could you just throw some light on this uh, point yeah. yeah there are two things that you have asked sir very simply i'll just answer them like you know you said that people have become more scared now yeah. the answer to that is like you know we were living with bats for quite a long time these bats and human beings were living for quite a long time if you go and find out for past 70 100 years these bat colonies were there in those areas and people were happily walking underneath that and all such kind of things now because of misinformation we are not able to you know we we are getting scared the misinformation wrong information that is happening in the society that is scaring us that is one second thing is about whether or not we should be able to we should consume or eat the fruits that uh, have been you know plucked by or eaten by and all such kind of things earlier also we used to eat now we are getting scared but as a scientist i would just like to say that unless and until i know that this fruit has been bitten by a bat and that bat is having a virus load although it might be having virus but the virus is not virulent then again unless and until i prove that how am i going to say that you know this is good or this is not good so uh, as a scientist i cannot just make a comment and say that you know you should not eat this fruit that fruit and all such kind of things if things need to if the virus is there and it is not going to affect you and it gets into your body it will increase increase the immunity in your body and all such kind of things for past so many hundreds of years we had been you know exposing ourselves to all such kind of uh, things and becoming more and more uh, immune uh, you know increasing our immunity to all these kind of things but in in the last uh, you know couple of decades we have seen that you know a lot of um, such kind of scare came in and we are controlling ourselves we are not exposing ourselves to such kind of situations where our we get exposed to pathogens at lower level and then get uh, in, increase the uh, you know natural immunity in our body and all such kind of things so sir it is like unless we know that this has been bitten by a bat if you are worried about it don't eat it sir that's it full stop if you are not worried give it to us we will eat so because the 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 uh, the question is the underlying point is like you know if you do anything good also with bad kind of you know thinking that something bad would happen bad would happen because you are mentally in that domain so that is what we have to avoid so guided and correct information would uh, lead to some kind of you know today also as you have rightly pointed out many people are scared of bats they are cutting trees they are cutting branches they are not allowing you know bats to come if the fruiting uh, season happens they are removing all the fruits imagine it's like snatching away food from young kids you can't do that and for so many years for 70 80 years you had been living in that house for 80 years you your uh, you know grandparent your father your parents have ap- appreciated bats coming in there uh, and eating the fruits and suddenly now because somebody says that you know because of bats viral diseases increase and this happens that happens and all such kind of things you are hating them that 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 doesn't make sense so we need to have good correct information saying that okay what is going to happen if at all these things when people tell me that you know they have detected 
coronavirus in bat? I say, yes, they have detected bat coronavirus in bats. I would be, uh, you know, feeling bad if they have detected human coronavirus or SARS coronavirus COV2 in bats. Then I would be, you know, RAR, you have not even left bats. You have infected the bats now. So I would be, you know, thinking in that manner. But basically what we have to understand is the information, correct information, be it with bats, be it with snakes, be it with lizards, anything. The correct information would drive you towards loving those organisms. If not, then the wrong information is going to, you know, make you hate. Now, this is the slide that I just wanted to show that, you know, why I love bats. Because I see there is no difference between the two photographs I have displayed on this slide. There's no difference from my point of view, because I know human beings and I also know bats as good as human beings. For me, both of them are as beautiful and as wonderful as they are meant to be. That is the information that I have. And that is why I love both the species equally. I don't hate any of these. So that is the kind of attitude. That is the kind of, you know, uh, domain that we have to create all around us so that younger generation and people also in general come to know that, yes, nothing is bad. Only thing is, you know, sometimes because we are, our, our immunity is not good. It's a natural selection process. It happens. It's all because of, you know, the way nature functions. It's, it's all like that. So that's, that's, that's it. Hope, uh, Satyanarayan, sir, I have answered you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Satyanarayan, sir, humble uh, namaskaram to you. A very senior wildlife uh, biology professor. Um, Karen, if uh, there are no more questions, uh, could we proceed with uh, Nick? Uh, Chelmala, sir, uh, I convey my gratitude to Thank you, you on my personal behalf and, of course, on behalf of my institution. And I hope and pray we will continue to collaborate for uh, disseminating the right knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. God bless. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you, Thank you very happy much. to have you continue in this second technical session. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I have to leave um, because my vice right. chancellor is waiting for my right. meeting. Thank you, Thank I have you a meeting with him. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Very Thank, much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of the first uh, talk by the invited speaker. And on a note of apology to the next speaker, Dr. Arinja Banerjee, who's been with us for quite some time. Um, a note of apology and a note of extreme gratitude for accepting this invitation, despite a you know, very uncomfortable uh, time zone difference. Uh, I would like to welcome our next speaker for uh, today's international webinar, a person who we all are waiting to listen to is Dr. Arun Jay Banerjee, uh, an extremely kind person uh, who willingly accepted our invitation to be part of this international webinar. And please allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Arun Jay Banerjee uh, very briefly. Of course, he's got a, you know an amazing profile to speak about, but for uh, want of time, I'll try to be a little brief and crisp. Dr. Arun Jay Banerjee, Currently is the principal investigator, scientist, and virologist at the Laboratory of Zoonotic Viruses and Comparative Immunology of University of uh, Saskatchewan Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, which is uh, you know abbreviated as VIDO in Canada. He works with international partners to study human and animal pathogens in developing countries. Um, Dr. Banerjee completed his PhD at the University of Saskatchewan in 2018. His doctoral thesis was awarded, very notably, the university's best life sciences thesis award and the Governor's, Governor General's gold medal. Quite an achievement. Dr. Banerjee completed his postdoc training as a Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada Fellow at the McMaster University between 2018 and 2000, 2021 during which, very importantly, he was appointed as a visiting scientist at the University of Toronto to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. His research group at VIDO Canada investigates emerging bad bone zoonotic viruses, such as, of course, the coronaviruses, along with deciphering the immunological consequences of infection in reservoir species, which, uh, insofar as COVID-19 is concerned, whole focus being on bats, and very importantly, a spillover mammalian species, both 
in the human and the agriculture domain. So his research interests uh, includes uh, zoonotic virus discovery and pathogenesis. He's been a part of the leading team of virologists to isolate the SARS-CoV-2 from the bats, confirming the spillover. Virus host interactions in reservoir and spillover species, mechanisms of virus persistence in hosts, discovering and harnessing novel antiviral responses. I, I think uh, this is just a small, in a nutshell, his achievements at such a young age. Uh, Dr. Arinjay Banerjee, we welcome you, and I must convey our collective pride of uh, a man of Indian origin, a man of science, doing so extremely well in a foreign land. Welcome to you and Dr. Arinja Banerjee, the session is open for uh, your I mean, presentation. Dr. Arinja Banerjee, please. Thank you, Dr. Borker, and thanks for inviting me. Let's, let's try and share my screen, yeah, see if this works. Um, yes, sir, it, it does. It, it's very clear, Dr. Banerjee, yes. Please, please call me Arinja. You don't have to call me sir or any of that. All of you are a lot more senior scientists than I am. <laughs> Okay, let's, um, good, how's this? Yes, perfect. It's Excellent. Great. Thank you. Good. So I think Dr. Srinivasulu gave an excellent primer on bats and bat bond viruses. So I'm, I'm happy I don't have a lot of introductory slides for you. What I do have today is I'll, I'll share my story with you. I'll, I'll share what we do for a living, how we study bats, and what we study in bats, I do want to start off with what Dr. Srinivasulu ended, that we shouldn't be penalizing bats. Bats are not to be blamed for any pathogens that are spilled over into humans. And through my talk, I'll continue to reiterate this, that bats are not at fault. It's largely humans interacting with bats. So my name is Erin Banerjee. I'm a principal research scientist at the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization. We are based at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. And you can also follow me on Twitter. I have a Twitter handle, Sai underscore questions. And we are set up at, so our acronym is VEDO. I think Dr. Borker clarified this earlier on. And my research group, we call ourselves the Laboratory of Zoonotic Viruses, because obviously viruses that come from animals are of interest to us. And we also call ourselves the Laboratory of Comparative Immunology, because we take these zoonotic viruses and we study how they interact with the wildlife reservoir host and the spillover human and livestock hosts. So at Vito, we have access to one of the largest high containment laboratories in North America. We've also got over 45 plus PhD level scientists who are all working towards preventing the next pandemic. Currently, we are focused on preventing the current pandemic. We were the first to develop a vaccine candidate against COVID-19 in Canada, along with isolating the virus and a whole bunch of other um, anti-COVID-19 science. We've got over $200 million in infrastructure. So if you folks are interested in pursuing your PhDs, postdocs, please reach out to me or reach out to other scientists at Vito. If you want to work on TB, you want to work on emerging diseases, this is the place in Canada to come and do that kind of science. So before I dive into my science, science doesn't happen without funding. And we are exceptionally lucky that we've had lots of funding agencies over the last eight years that believed in what we do for a living. They believe that it's important to study zoonotic pathogens. They believe that it's important to study how these viruses interact with reservoir hosts. So we've been generously funded through uh, the NIH, the government of Saskatchewan, the University of Saskatchewan, during my postdoc through McMaster University, the Public Health Agency of Canada through in-kind support through their scientists, We've been supported by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And of course, NSERC has been a big funder of my personal fellowships as well. And a program called ITRAP, which utilizes a concept called One Health, which I'll come to at the, at the, end, of the end of my talk. Chat, So Dr. Borker mentioned I recently completed my postdoc and we are a very new group. This is my independent research lab at Vito. So right now we've got six people in the lab, including myself. So Dr. Kaushal Baith at the back is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab. He's leading a bunch of research projects. Dr. Akron Asawajaru is a research technician in the lab. Victoria Gonzalez is our first PhD student in the lab. And Damilola and Vedehi are undergraduate thesis, honors thesis students in the lab. So we are rapidly expanding, but we are fairly new. We are seven months into our lab. Now, before I dive into um, 
the crux of my talk on bats and bat viruses and immunology, perhaps speakers before me may have given you this introduction, but I'd like to reiterate the diversity of bats. You know, a lot of scientists, perhaps including some of you in the audience, we work with mice, right? My mouse is an excellent model for human science, but mouse really is one species, mus musculus. Folks work with different strains, palpsy and, and whatnot, but it's one species. Bats are over 1400 different species and researchers like yourself in the audience are constantly identifying new species of bats. So if you appreciate this person on the left and the size of the bat, this is a big, this is a big bat or a flying fox. And if you spread your arms, that's how big the wingspan of this bat is. And if you look at the smallest bat, the Thai bumblebee bat that can fit at the tip of your thumb, now that's fascinating for a mammalian species to have this huge diversity in body size. And now we know there are differences in immune responses as well. Now bats can also travel long distances. So there are bats in Canada that migrate to Canada from the United States. So this is a map of North America. The bats would move from the United States into Canada. In the summertime, they would feed in Canada. And in the winter, we get a lot of snow. So we do have Canadian resident bats that hibernate during winter, but then there are bats that fly back into the US. So obviously bats can travel long distances. And with that comes the potential of spreading any sort of, like somebody talked about ticks or potential pathogens. Now, bats are also exceptionally long lived. Now this is an area that I'm very interested in, but I don't necessarily have the skills to study this because I don't study cell longevity. But there are colleagues that are now looking at why bats have such an exceptional long lifespan. And can we take that knowledge to increase and enhance human lifespan? If we look at example of myotis, Brantii, this is a bat you do find in North America. And um, this bat has been clocked at 41 years old. Now the central dogma of lifespan in mammals is larger the mammal, longer the lifespan. The so small mammals are expected to have a short lifespan. So for a bat that is the size of a small mouse, having a lifespan of four decades is exceptional. And other researchers that are now studying why bats have this increased lifespan, it's fascinating. But the reason we study bats is uh, a little different. So you know bats, and again, Dr. Srinivasulu gave you an excellent primer on all the viruses that bats have. But what we are interested in is why bats can coexist with these viruses without disease. And some of these viruses can cause very severe disease in humans and animals. To give you some examples, filoviruses like Ebola and Marburg, coronaviruses that cause SARS, MERS, porcine epidemic diarrhea. I should have updated the slide and added two more viruses to it. Uh, this new porcine virus called SADS, swine acute diarrhea syndrome, and there's uh, potentially COVID-19. And paramyxoviruses, Nipah and Hendra virus. Nipah is a problem in Eastern India, and now there have been two outbreaks in Southern India as well, so that's, that's concerning. Hendra virus is a problem in Eastern Australia. And obviously the classical example of lysovirus is rabies virus. But again, to reiterate Dr. Srinivasulu's point, not all of these viruses have been directly identified in bats. Viruses that are very similar to SARS and MERS and SARS-CoV-2 have been identified in bats, but they're very similar. They're not the causative pathogen that's causing the pandemic. However, for filoviruses, Marburg virus has been directly identified in bats. For paramyxoviruses, both Nipah and Hendra virus have been directly identified in bats. So you wanna be careful when you label bats as reservoirs of nasty viruses. That's certainly not true. There are some species of bats of the 1400 species, there are some species of bats that carry some of these viruses and there's definitive evidence of it. For other viruses and other bat species, we only have anecdotal evidence. And for SARS-like or MERS-like viruses, we don't know if these viruses have the potential to infect humans. So take that thought and when you chat with your friends, you know, when people tell you bats have viruses, let them know that bats are not all bats are not bats. It's more than 1,400 different species. So you can't just label all bats with the same brush. To look at some of the life cycles, I'll give an example of Ebola virus and perhaps two coronaviruses after this. So we believe that Ebola virus circulates in bats in wildlife. So out in the jungles and forests, you'd expect Ebola virus to circulate in bats. From time to time, you'd have some spillovers into large mammals. So non-human primates or other large mammals. 
And eventually the virus can enter human populations. Obviously Ebola virus has extremely high mortality rates. However, there is now a vaccine that was developed in Canada and that vaccine is now being used to control ongoing outbreaks. You look at, uh, let's take an example of SARS, the original SARS coronavirus, the one that's caused an epidemic in 2002. So the data suggests the virus evolved in bats and it jumped into palm civet cats and from palm civet cats, the virus entered humans and then it went human to human in, and then spread across the planet. For MERS coronavirus, it's actually a little bit of a different story. The data suggests that the virus evolved about 30 years ago in bats. And then from bats, the virus moved into camels. And today, as of 2021, camels are considered the reservoirs of MERS coronavirus. And the virus occasionally spills over from camels into humans um, in the Middle East. And in fact, this, this study, this review in Nature, Nature Reviews Micro was published by my colleague, Daryl Palzerano, who's also a principal investigator at Vido. So again, as I talk about this science, if you're interested in pursuing our education and you're interested in our labs, please feel free to reach out. So what about Canada? You know, we talk about all of these potential viruses and bats, but do Canadian bats have any viruses that are of potential consequence? So I did my PhD with Dr. Vikram Mesra, and Vikram at the time had gone out with his colleagues and they've surveyed Canadian bats. And what they identified was Canadian bats, or at least little brown bats, do have polyoma and coronaviruses in them. However, just to clarify, we, we don't know if these viruses have the potential to infect humans. All we know is that bats carry these viruses, and Dr. Srinivasulu gave you a whole list of viral families that have been detected in bats. Again, take all of this with a grain of salt. We know these viruses exist. We don't know if the viruses can jump from bats. We don't know if the viruses can infect humans or livestock. Let's look at the evolution of coronaviruses. You know, there are seasonal coronaviruses, there's four of them. So let's go top down, NL63, 229E, OC43, and HKU1. These are coronaviruses that might infect you. You might get sick, you'll have the sniffles, you'll have a little bit of cold and you'll, you'll walk it off. And then there are high pathogenic coronaviruses that are more lethal that perhaps would kill you if you are predisposed to severe infection. That would be the original SARS coronavirus, MERS coronavirus, SARS-CoV for pigs, and now we have SARS coronavirus too as well. So if you look at all of these viruses, two of the four seasonal coronaviruses, there's anecdotal evidence suggesting these viruses come from bats. They've evolved in bats, moved through a potential intermediate host. Now, an intermediate host is any animal species that bridges the transmission of a virus from its natural reservoir host to humans or to a livestock species. If you look at the high pathogenic coronaviruses, unfortunately, all of them seem to have evolved in bats. Now, this is what the data suggests. There could be data that's missing. There could be animals we haven't identified. And most of you folks are wildlife biologists, so you can appreciate the difficulty of sampling wildlife species. So as of 2021, the data suggests these viruses evolved in bats, moved into certain intermediate species, and jumped into humans. So what about SARS coronavirus 2? Where did, where did this virus come from and what does the data suggest? So earlier last year, we tried to identify or we tried to put together this article highlighting the possibility of the virus evolving in bats. Now we do know that bats have many different coronaviruses and Dr. Sinibasulu called them bat coronaviruses. And I couldn't agree with him more. These are bat coronaviruses. And we also know that bat coronaviruses can perhaps spread between different bats when they're roosting. If you're a wildlife biologist, if you've studied bats, you know that different bat species can co-roost at the same roosting site. So that's a good opportunity for pathogens to spread not just between the same species, but also across different species. As bats have new puppies, the pups, get, the pups can get infected. As new bats migrate into a colony, the new bats present a naive host again that can get infected. So we speculate that it's possible that bat born coronaviruses can transmit between bats. However, what could happen from time to time and what's happened with other viruses, these viruses can jump into other species. So there are multiple possibilities that could have led to the emergence of SARS-2. The virus could have directly jumped from bats into a human and then could have adapted into humans to cause this pandemic. There's also a possibility that the virus could have jumped into an unknown intermediate mammalian host 
So we, this is a question mark because we don't, we still don't know what the species could be. And the bat virus could have then adapted in the species and then jumped into humans. There was a little bit of controversy at the time about pangolins. The pangolins have pangolin coronaviruses that are very similar to SARS coronavirus 2. So we also added this into this picture of potential transmission of SARS 2. And it's possible the virus jumped from bats into pangolins and then went from pangolins into humans. However, what's also possible, and very few people talked about this, it's possible that we gave pangolins the coronavirus. So pangolins are, are it's, it's part of the wildlife trade market. They're extremely uh, in demand for certain medicinal uses in certain countries where people believe that their scales and bones and other tissues can give you medicinal benefit. So obviously there's a black market for pangolins and because humans are part of the black market or humans are actually running the black market, if infected handlers are handling pangolins, we could easily infect these pangolins. And then the virus would adapt in pangolins and when you detect them, you would get this false positive that pangolins have a SARS-like coronavirus. So these are all possibilities. And I think we still don't know with 100% certainty where SARS coronavirus 2, eventually how it jumped into humans and what caused this back and forth transmission. And Dr. Sunil Basu will give you an excellent list of bat borne viruses. But what I wanted to highlight this is how complex it is for a virus to jump species. This extremely, just because a bat has a coronavirus does not necessarily mean the bat will infect humans. And this was highlighted very well by my colleague, Rena Plowright at Montana State University. And I'm gonna break it down for you and I'm going to explain to you how complex this zoonotic transfer process is. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll appreciate that it's not as simple as going and touching a bat. It's much more complex than that. So for, to begin with, you have to have reservoir host distribution. So if you're studying a bat coronavirus, you have to have that bat species in your neighborhood. And mind you, again, bats are over 1,400 different species. And Dr. Srinivasulu highlighted how they're geographically diverse and distributed. So if you're looking at, let's say, a myotis lucifugus bats, and you're worried that a myotis lucifugus coronavirus is going to infect you in India, it's just not going to happen. It is physically impossible to happen. So there has to be reservoir host distribution. And there has to be reservoir host density. Think about it. If you only have two bats in all of Hyderabad, for example, what are the chances of you coming in contact with two bats? Extremely low. But if you have 2 million bats that's roosting perhaps under a bridge, then you're increasing your chances of coming in contact with bats. There has to be pathogen prevalence. Again, not all bats are infected. Not all bat species are infected. Even within the same species, not all individuals are infected. So there has to be sufficient pathogen prevalence for the bat that you come in contact with to give you a disease or to give you a potential pathogen. There has to be infection intensity. Just because a bat, if you do a qPCR test, qPCR is extremely sensitive. Just because you detect a virus particle in a bat does not necessarily mean the bat is going to shed that pathogen. If the virus stays inside the bat, there is no way the virus would be shed and you would get exposed. So there has to be sufficient infection in the host. And there has to be pathogen release from reservoir host. So just because, again, to my case in point from my previous statement, just because a bat has a pathogen does not necessarily expose you or livestock to that pathogen. Now, once a bat, let's presume Nipah virus, for example. It can exist in bat saliva or bat urine, but that pathogen has to survive outside of the bat. When a bat poops, if the poop drops on the floor, drops on the ground, or a bat licks a fruit, there was a question previously about fruits being licked by bats, that pathogen, if there is a pathogen, that pathogen has to survive on the surface of the fruit. Envelope viruses, such as coronaviruses, are extremely sensitive to desiccation or to drying up. If the weather's dry, the virus will get inactivated. If it's too hot, the virus will get inactivated. So the pathogen has to survive. And then there has to be human exposure. So let's presume all of this has happened, then you or I have to go and get exposed to that pathogen. Now, our bodies have an excellent immune system. And again, Dr. Srinivasulu talked about you know, getting tired and immune system um, losing its potential. So the virus or the pathogen has to go beyond our immune system. And that, that, that takes into account the next 
fragment of this innate immune response and adaptive immune response. I won't get into the details of this. And then finally, the virus has to adapt, replicate in humans, and spread between humans to cause an epidemic or a pandemic. So what I'm really trying to highlight is all of these structural barriers have these holes in them, and all the holes have to align for a successful zoonotic spillover. Now, this seems very easy when you look at this. What's really happening in the wild is all of these layers are constantly shifting. So now think about it as a golf course. Think about it as eight floor golf course and you're trying to pass a ball through all of these holes at the same time. It's, it's an impossible likelihood. It's highly unlikely. And now that's why all the bats have all of these viruses. It's extremely unlikely and it's an unfortunate event when a virus can successfully jump, go through all of these holes and infect humans. Now, Dr. Sinivasan talked about human animal contact. Now, there are certain practices we do perform. So we do eat, some of us like our chickens, some of us like our muttons. And, uh, you know, we all have our food preferences and that puts us into contact with different kinds of animals. And perhaps coming into contact with animals is a potential risk factor for these novel emerging zoonotic pathogens. But we also, we also touched upon stress in the previous talk and how stress causes um, animals to shed pathogens. You know, as part of this wildlife trade and us harvesting these animals for food, what we've started doing is we are creating this artificial ecosystem. So let's say in, in a natural ecosystem, perhaps a bat and a raccoon dog or bats and palm civets would never come in contact or bats and snakes would never come in contact. But now when we're caging them to sell them in a market, we're stacking them in these cages, one on top of the other, right? So when a bat poops or a bat urinates, that urine can now land on a raccoon dock. The poop can rat land on snakes. So we are creating this artificial ecosystem that can now facilitate the transmission of novel pathogens that would never happen in a natural habitat. And when that happens, so you know, people often argue, why should we worry about it? You know, I'm in Australia or I'm in India. We've never had a bad form zoonotic outbreak. Why should I be worried about it? We are living in a pandemic that probably originated from one spillover event and it's become a global pandemic. Now take a look at this video. Let me play this. So this is a video of daylight shifting from the right side of your screen to the left side. And every yellow dot that you're seeing is an airplane. This is an airplane that's flying from the east to the west. And as you see daylight approaches Europe, you start seeing millions and millions of planes and this whole thing will become a bright yellow spot. And as daylight approaches North America, you'll see all of these flights will now start coming into North America. So in a matter of 24 hours, airplanes can carry millions of people across the planet. So you'll see all of these planes coming in. And on each plane, you have about 300 humans. Now imagine if each plane is one pathogen, it takes you less than 24 hours to go across the planet. So, Zuna, so you, we, we have to be careful, right? It's not, we shouldn't wave things off by saying it's not a problem for our country. COVID-19 perhaps started off as a problem for one country, but now it's one of the largest coronavirus pandemics in our known history. So zoonotic viruses do exist and we should certainly keep studying them because we are only one flight away from a novel pathogen. So what is One Health? Dr. Suni Vasulu talked about how human health, animal health, they're all connected. We are encroaching upon animal health. And that's causing all of these new pathogens to jump. And that's entirely true. In, in Canada and in some of the Western countries, we call this as the One Health concept. And I know there's sufficient traction of One Health in India as well, because I've got colleagues and friends that are trying to do this. So One Health is a concept that believes that human health animal health and environment health are extremely intricately connected. You mess with one of these, so let's say we destroy the environment, there's going to be a direct consequence on our animals and humans. You mess with animals, we'll have a direct consequence on the environment of humans. And perhaps not so much if we actually mess with humans, we are the ones messing with both animals and the environment. I'll give you a prime example of Nipah virus in Malaysia, or Nipah virus when you know, fruit trees were grown close to pig farms that attracted bats and that caused spillover of Nipah virus into Malaysian pigs. So affecting the environment certainly affects humans and animals. And I'll close with this at the end of my slide when I, when I get there. 
No, SARS-2 is a human problem. As of today, human beings are the largest reservoirs of SARS coronavirus 2. Forget about bats, forget about animals. We are the biggest threats and we can infect any susceptible animal species on the planet and they will likely get it from us. And there have been recent reports, if you've been following the news, there have been recent reports of white-tailed deer infection. So large scale infection in American deer populations. So we are also concerned and you know, lots of researchers are now looking at how this virus can jump from humans to animals. So zoo anthroponosis is what we call a pathogen that transmits from humans to animals and zoonosis is animals to humans. So although this COVID-19 pandemic could have initially been a zoonotic pathogen, right now we are concerned about zooanthroponosis of this virus from humans into our susceptible wildlife, livestock, and companion animal populations. But why are we concerned? Let's say we are fighting, we are fighting COVID-19. We've got these fantastic vaccines that will protect humans, and hopefully we'll, we're hoping to see the end of this pandemic. But you know, it's been impossible to eradicate or eliminate a virus with a wildlife host. So if this virus continues to spread into our wildlife species or, or other animals populations, it's possible that we'll start creating this alternate reservoir species. Now there are concerns, can deer population become a reservoir for SARS coronavirus too? There's no data for it yet, but there's data suggesting that these deer populations can get infected. So researchers are now trying to study if the deer populations can maintain SARS coronavirus 2 in them. So if this does happen, there are three possibilities that might play out in our animal population. So let's assume the virus infects. So everything in red is SARS coronavirus 2 infection intensity and blue is immune response. So let's presume scenario one, where you have infection, then the animal mounts an immune response and the infection disappears over time. That's perfect. There's very low chances of the virus persisting in its animal population. This would be the best case scenario for viruses in animals. But there's also a second possibility that the virus can persist not at the individual level because the individual might have a good immune response, but the virus can persist at the population level. So let's say you've got an infection, SARS-2 infection, the individual mountain immune response, but then the immune response will eventually wane over time. That's why we are talking about booster shots now. And if the infection wanes over time, the animal becomes susceptible again and the virus can reinfect this animal. So you'll have this wave of infection and clearance and infection and clearance at the population level. What really happens with reservoir species is that the virus can persist both at the population level and the individual level. So when a bat or any animal, when let's say when animal X gets infected, the animal would have virus infection, would mount an immune response, the immune response would suppress virus infection, but it would not clear virus infection. So there would still be low levels of infection in the animal. And as the immune system starts waning off and disappearing, the virus infection will resurface. And probably, this is probably one of the hypotheses is we think that some animals can shed viruses periodically, but not all the time. There's some dynamic relationship between virus and the immune response. These are all theories and these theories are still to be tested. And hopefully in the next few years, some of us will test it. But why should we be concerned? Let's be honest, the impact of COVID-19 and our approach to COVID-19 has been very human centric. And now we are starting to look at the consequence of infection in our animal populations. So if we look at this problem from a human centric perspective, if we give animals SARS coronavirus 2, the virus may adapt in these animals. And this has already happened. The virus has adapted in mink, and on mink farms, the virus has gone back and infected humans. The mink adapted SARS coronavirus 2. So it is a real possibility. This is not a theory, it has happened with one animal species. The problem is if the spike protein adapts in animals, there are four different things that can happen. Now, if you've been following SARS coronavirus 2 studies, the virus interacts with the cell receptor to get into our cells. And the receptor for humans is ACE2, or we call it ACE2. So if the adapted virus does not bind to our receptor, that's great. No problems. The virus can no longer infect humans. We all move on. It's all sunshine and rainbows. But the problem is that this animal adapted SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein can interact with human ACE2 with enhanced capacity. That might cause more severe infections, and you may have, or we may have, a new variant to deal with. 
The other possibility is we're all getting vaccinated and we want our vaccines to continue to work. So far, the data suggests the vaccines work against all variants. But what if in the future an animal adapted variant evolves in our wildlife populations or companion animal populations? And this virus can no longer be neutralized by our antibodies. If it does get neutralized, let's say there's an ad animal adapted variant, our antibodies continue to bind to the spike protein, it's all good. We'll still be protected and we'll be great. We'll move on from this pandemic. But what if there's an animal variant, but the antibody can no longer interact with the spike protein? Then we've got a problem. Then we'll, then we'll have to reset our clock to 2019 and start fighting this pandemic all over again. So these are studies that some of us or most of us are very interested in or are, are working on. We want to understand this. We want to predict this and see if we can really get out of this pandemic. So what do we study? You know, so when I started my PhD, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2014, I was very intrigued by how these coronaviruses cause disease. So if you look at backbone coronaviruses, <clears throat> like Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, or original SARS, or even the pig coronavirus, all of these viruses cause disease that's driven by a very strong inflammatory response. So what is inflammation? If you pinch your skin, you'll see a little bit of swelling, you'll feel some pain, and you'll see some redness. That's a very simplistic definition of what a localized inflammation is. What these viruses do, they cause that inflammation inside your lungs, and your body starts drowning in that inflammation. You run out of breath, you go into acute respiratory distress, and that causes uh, fatality and you die. So I was very interested that why these coronaviruses cause such severe disease in humans, but we don't see anything in bats. And I wanted to learn how bats can control these infections using their immune responses. So at the time, we didn't have any tools to study bats and viruses. And Dr. Sunivasulu mentioned how there was little interest in studying bats. In our field, all our research is dependent on reagents and chemicals that will work for bat cells. And because of the limited interest, and because of how diverse bat species are, we are extremely limited with tools to study viruses. So one of the things I had to develop and we needed to study bat viruses are bat cell lines. So I developed the cell line uh, from big brown bats or Eptesicus fuscus bats. And from their kidneys, we made these cells that grow on Petri dishes. Once we have these cells, we now had tools to infect them and study them. So these are, so the first three are cells from bats. The Vero cells are from African green monkey kidneys and MRC5s are human lung cells. And just having a cell line is not sufficient your cells have to support virus replication. So at the time in 2015, we tested the cell lines for virus replication. We were able to show, this was in collaboration with Dr. Vincent Munster at the Rocky Mountain Labs. It's an NIH funded lab. And we were able to show that Middle East respiratory syndrome coronavirus replicated in these cells, vesicular stomatitis virus, which is a virus from the same family as rabies, replicated in these cells. And porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, which is a big coronavirus, also replicated in these cells. And what you're seeing at the bottom left is a video of our bat cells that are propagating in, in a petri dish. So we now had a tool to study viruses and to study how bats can mount an immune response against these viruses. And that's what we went on to do. So over the last nine years, we've been studying how bat cells and viruses interact and how that's different or similar to humans. So this slide summarizes about nine years of work that we've been doing with these viruses and bats and human cells. So what we really identify is coronaviruses, when they infect our cells, human lung cells, we have a very low antiviral response. And now that's, that is very bad. Because generally, typically when we get infected, we want our cells to have a strong antiviral response. However, these viruses have proteins that can very efficiently block our antiviral response. So the virus can start replicating unchecked and that causes problems for us. On the contrary, what we also see is the cells that are infected produce very high levels of inflammatory responses. And like I mentioned previously, inflammation is really what drives the pathology with these coronavirus infections, highly pathogenic coronavirus infections in humans. When we started studying bats, we saw the exact opposite. We saw that bat cells can actually produce a lot of antiviral responses, which is great because that can control virus replication. And at the same time, infected bat cells produce very low inflammatory responses. So perhaps this is why bats can coexist with bat-borne coronaviruses 
They have a strong antiviral response and they have very low self-damaging inflammatory responses. So overall, a lot of my studies before COVID-19 was with MERS coronavirus. At the time, the world didn't have SARS-CoV-2. So we studied everything using the Middle East respiratory syndrome coronavirus, which is a nastier cousin of SARS-2. It's got a higher mortality rate. And the virus, what we realized was because humans have a low antiviral response when infected, we perhaps have high virus replication and hence bad disease outcomes. Whereas bats have a strong antiviral response and perhaps that's what controls virus replication and hence low disease pathogenesis and low fatality or perhaps even no fatality in bats. But so we know this now. We know how bats can control infection. We know why bats can coexist with these viruses. But what can we do to improve disease outcomes in humans? What can we learn from bats and improve our own outcomes? So something I did during my postdoc was studying this protein called RF3. Now RF3 is one of the transcription factors that drives the, antiviral, the innate antiviral response in our cells. So I was studying this protein and I was trying to identify if this protein was critical for the antiviral response in bats. And that's what we found along with colleagues and my undergraduate students, we embarked on this project. And what we were able to show is that bat RF3 is extremely potent when you challenge the cells with the viral mimic. So poly IC mimics an RNA virus infection. If I may, it mimics a coronavirus infection. And we were able to show when cells are stimulated with poly IC, bat RF3 turns on antiviral responses much more strongly than human cells. And we point this out to one amino acid residue. Now proteins are a chain of amino acids. They have different amino acids. We identified one critical amino acid in bat RF3, which is a serine at the 185th position. The serine residue was important for the strong antiviral response. At the same residue in our own, in human RF3, we have a leucine residue. And we saw that this, in, in our human cells, the antiviral response was much lower than the bat cells. What we then did next was we took the bat serine residue and we introduced it into the human RF3. And that significantly increased our antiviral response. So what I'm trying to get here is, while we do study how bats have a strong immune response, the goal is to understand and learn from bats to improve our own immune responses and to perhaps help us tackle some of these virus infections better than what we are doing now. So during all of this, while I was doing my postdoc, I was, we were learning about bat immune responses. The world started figuring out that there's a new pandemic that's coming out of China. So the initial news in December, 2019, when we heard about an, an unknown pneumonia outbreak in mainland China, some of us got worried that this could potentially be a new respiratory pathogen. So at the time I was a postdoc at McMaster University and I reached out to my colleague at the University of Toronto. And I, we had a team meeting and we decided if the virus ever came to Canada, we would get samples, we would isolate it, and we would rapidly characterize it because that would help vaccine development and diagnostics and research. And unfortunately, the virus did arrive in Canada the last week of February in 2020. And when the virus did arrive, we sampled the first three patients that were diagnosed as COVID-19 positive. So we collected these empty swabs. So these are swabs that go up your nose. Some of you folks may have gotten these tests done. And at the time, this was very early days. The WHO had not called it a pandemic yet. This was just starting to look like an epidemic and eventually turned into a pandemic. So we took these samples from this clinical specimen from patients. We put them on Vero E6 cells. Now these are immunocompromised monkey kidney cells. And we were able to isolate the virus in these cells, which we then confirmed using qPCR. So most of you know what a qPCR is. This is what's being used for diagnostics. And we also sequenced the whole genome of the virus using nanopore sequencing and, and mini-seq sequencing. And this was the first image of the virus isolated in Canada. And let's walk you through this. These are human lung epithelial cells and where you see all of these electron dense particles. So this is an electron micrograph. We use an electron microscope to do this. And all of these electron dense particles are SARS coronavirus 2 particles. And if you zoom into one of these, I hope you can appreciate this light gray halo outside of the virus particle. So the virus gets its name coronavirus because corona means a crown. The spike protein forms a crown around this round virus particle. 
And this grace, the slight gray structures on the outside is the crown that this virus is wearing. So we knew we had isolated the virus and then we started, we rapidly shared the virus isolate for vaccine development, for diagnostic development and for basic science. And we've then gone on to do a lot more studies with how SARS-2 infects humans, how SARS-2 induces an immune response in humans. And most recently, we put this uh, paper out in collaboration with Chris Overall at the University of British Columbia. What we were trying to do was understand how SARS coronavirus 2 interacts with our cellular proteins. And can we identify critical cellular proteins that the virus requires for replication? And that makes them potential drug targets. So long story short, uh, Chris Overall and I, we worked very closely, our teams, and his team was eventually able to identify about 58 high confidence substrates are our cellular proteins that are required for certain steps in SARS coronavirus 2 replication. And each of these substrates could potentially be identified as uh, drug targets moving on. So where are we headed? If you look at the blueprint of priority infectious diseases. This is the World Health Organization or the WHO's priority list. Now, six out of the 10 pathogens or six out of the 10 viruses on this list have a bad origin. And one of them is called disease X. So if you think today disease X is COVID-19 and seven out of these 10 viruses have a bad origin. So obviously it's very important to study these viruses, identify the tropism of these viruses and see if they can infect us. And that's essentially what the goal really is for bat researchers across the planet, for bat infectious disease researchers across the planet. The goal is to identify the viruses that bats carry. And again, Dr. Suni Vasulu made an excellent point of the need to survey Indian bats. We've got lots of good data on bats in certain parts of Africa, bats in China, but there's extremely limited data from Indian bats and what viruses perhaps Indian bats can carry. Once we have these sequences, we can identify, can these viruses potentially infect other species? Can it infect humans? Can it infect our livestock? Can it infect companion animals like dogs and cats? If you have the virus sequence, you can develop diagnostics. Before the world had the sequence for COVID, for SARS-2, there were no diagnostics. The diagnostics are qPCRs. qPCRs are based off primers. The primers, you need the sequences of the virus to design them. So again, you need the virus information. You need to know the diversity of the pathogens in our wildlife species. Once we have the sequence, we can make vaccines. The moment the SARS coronavirus 2 sequence was made public, everybody went on to make over 100 vaccine candidates because the sequence allows you to do that. But once you have the sequence, you can also develop drug candidates. So the first step really is to identify your enemy. If you don't know the virus, you don't know the pathogen, you can't fight it. And I'll end with the slide where I'll talk about One Health again, that it's, it's critical to take on a One Health approach. Why are bats shedding viruses? Why are these animals coming into contact? What are humans doing to the environment that's forcing animals to come into contact? And that really is One Health and we have to collaborate, we have to coordinate, we have to communicate. I won't touch upon any of this because I think Dr. Suni Basulu made an excellent point of communicating that bats are not to be blamed. A lot of us researchers work in our own silos. So zoologists like to work with zoologists. Us infectious disease folks, we like to work with infectious disease folks, but that needs to change. What COVID-19 has shown us that working in our own disciplines, working in our own silos is not going to help us prevent the next pandemic. We can make the best vaccine on the planet, but if, if the public don't want to take the vaccine, we are unable to fight the pandemic. So there has to be science communication involved. There has to be vaccine hesitancy information. So I think it, it really has to, all of us, social scientists, health scientists, you know, we all have to come together and work together to prevent the next pandemic. With that note, I'll end. And um, again, you can find us on, on I, I do have a lab website, so you can reach us to the lab website. We have an institutional website, so you can look up every other research project that's going on. You can look up other principal investigators and thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Banji, uh, for this extraordinary uh, presentation on various cross-cutting themes of the bats and zoonotic spillover. I, I think uh, it couldn't have been more uh, um, variable exercise at demystifying the complexities involved in the whole gamut of issues and 
Thank you again for giving us an insight in the frontline area of research happening in your laboratory. I remain grateful to you for your support and willingness to associate with us. And of course, wishing you all the best in your future endeavors. I convey our collective pride on your achievements. Thank and you. uh, I think now the session is uh, open for discussion. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Karen, could you please communicate those to Dr. Banerjee, please? Yes, uh, there are a couple of questions right now. There is one from uh, Delecta de Costa. She says, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is sensitive to desiccation then formites would not be a major source of transmission. Why was there so much emphasis on not touching surfaces or immediately sanitizing your hands after touching these surfaces? So I think this has been clarified. So when the pandemic first started, none of us knew what the pathogen was. So the WHO came up with the best possible recommendations based on the evidence that everybody had. Science evolves, you're all scientists, most of you are scientists, you know science evolves and as science evolves, policies change. So as we started learning more about the pathogen, the policies changed and that's pretty much it. We figured out that the virus is susceptible to desiccation. But again, like, think about it. Let's say a person sneezed, right? And you, and you come in immediately after that person sneezed. The virus would need a certain amount of time to become inactivated. But you don't know who was in that room before you. You don't know who was sitting on that bus before you were sitting. So I think, you know, sanitizing your hands and being careful is, is perhaps better, I think, than not sanitizing your hands. But you're correct. Fomites have been now identified. Fomites have been classified as low risk. This, this changed during the pandemic, yes. Thank you. Uh, the next question is by Dr. Manoj Borkar, and he asks, um, what is the expected trajectory of the current COVID-19 pandemic, in your opinion? And how does the World Health Organization declare any pandemic as over? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's anybody's guess, right? When will the pandemic end? Um, we're very hopeful with the vaccines. I think vaccines will lead to the end of the pandemic. But we start seeing all of these new waves and new variants. And I really believe that this virus is going to stick around. We will learn how to live with it. We will learn how to manage it through vaccines and, and you know, masking when there are localized outbreaks. And just like flu, I think our elderly population will be more susceptible to serious disease moving on. So it's really up to us, all of us collectively as human beings to take care of each other and you know, continue doing the right thing. And when will it end? I don't have a date for you. I don't think anybody can put a date on when this pandemic will end. <laughs> Um, okay, there is any, okay, I think there's some question from Sachin King. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Are there any conclusive studies on how the virus passed on from bats to humans? So if you, uh, I talked about how complex it is to, you know, for, for a zoonotic spillover. Now think about it. Let's say you are the scientist, uh, Sachin. Let's presume you're the scientist and your lab is leading this project where you would identify where SARS to came from. How many samples are you going to collect? And if this was a one-time event, let's say this happened in, in October 2019, let's presume, yeah? How, would you, how are you going to go back and collect samples from October 2019? It becomes, you know, if you're doing wildlife surveillance studies, you'll start appreciating how difficult it is to work with wildlife animals. You One, you can't track them. Even if you put trackers on them, you put microchips on them, you can't always track them. So, long, so longitudinal studies become extremely difficult with wildlife species. And if this was one bat that spread this virus to one person, I think it's going to be impossible to identify the bat. So it's, it's extremely difficult to pinpoint where this happened and how it happened. But we can go off of anecdotal data. If you look at viruses that have been found in bats, they're extremely similar to viruses like SARS-CoV-2. So in the absence of other evidence, this is the only evidence we have. If something changes, like science evolves, if more evidence comes up moving on, then we will perhaps retrack it back to rat and dogs. Perhaps dogs gave it to humans, we don't know. But as of today, the strongest evidence we have suggests it came from bats. Um, okay, I think Dr. Nandakumar has a question. Dr. Nandakumar? Dr. Kamath, could you please uh, 
unmute and uh, yeah yeah unmuted. i have unmuted unmuted because the two questions which i sent directly to professor banerji they were not listed out uh, can you hear me dr banerji hello yes go ahead dr kumar uh, my sister is uh, sister in law is in your town <laughs> i would pass oh on. yeah 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 she is recently arrived in saskatchewan uh, her is a farm there it's like a prairie he was saying lot of wheat field she is a sick uh, pass on the message that uh, this talk was very educative informative and stimulating and a warning signal right at right time i believe because uh, the facts that you mentioned based on empirical research would definitely generate lot of enthusiasm for subject of virology in india Uh, in coming years my two questions are very simple and specific uh, if they are uh, going to elicit long answer please do not answer i can uh, send you the question by email first question uh, dr banerji is very simple you know it is a very uh, uh, this one means a sort of a you showed two things one is the humans have a sort of a cytokine storm and you know inflammatory response which is extraordinary and uh, we have an, a low antiviral defense against this uh, corona virus as in bats which harbor such a diversity of viruses what is the secret of their immune system that is my first question that they themselves don't get infected and die like you know some of the birds which carry the viruses or some animals we see like even monkeys uh, which uh, are uh, infected with tick borne viruses you know there is mortality in those carriers but uh, why the bats you know what is the special that uh, speciality of the bat immune system because humans and bats are both mammals so is there something in the due course of evolution which has given advantage to the bats sir first question yeah i think you touched upon it dr kamath you i think you answered your question it is evolutionary yes so bats evolved about 50 million years ago and humans evolved i think 200000 years so modern human homo sapiens sapiens we evolved about 200000 years ago so we are one of the newest species on the planet and perhaps bats have had the opportunity to co-evolve and adapt to these viruses longer than we have mm-hmm. now think about the seasonal coronaviruses oc43 and the ones that just caused the flu right mm-hmm. or not the flu the ones that caused the common cold it's possible that sars2 is evolve and become a common cold pathogen it's possible that we've had previous pandemics in our history perhaps not in a written down history but hundreds of thousands of years ago when oc43 and other common pathogens evolved it's possible they started as a pandemic and then evolved to become low pathogenic some of us are some of us are expecting that sars2 will perhaps evolve eventually to just become a common cold virus but that's not guaranteed it's all speculations as far as bats are concerned the hypothesis is they've co-evolved for millions of years with these viruses and that's fine tuned their immune response my second question is uh, related to india and uh, it's basically a ba- major policy question for which we have to do lot of advocacy and you were uh, external advice as a non resident indian uh, performing uh, you know that uh, scientist will be very important the reason is very simple we have to do capacity building in india and uh, strengthen our national institute of virology and uh, regional virology centers because we are sitting ducks for india and china we are spending a lot on weapons of mass destruction but not uh, you know that uh, corresponding expenditure is seen in capacity building infrastructure development what should be our priorities sir in this direction to understand now the problem of emerging diseases especially in tropical asia and uh, uh, possibilities of you know some new uh, virus is coming out starting new pandemics in view of human interference in uh, natural ecosystems and uh, due to climate change we cannot predict anything no model can predict when would be the next pandemic but these are two big countries having almost one third one uh, i mean 40% of world population and are they doing enough in virological research preventive surveillance what what are, what would be your uh, top priorities for countries like india it's not question of money perhaps it is a question of political and administrative will sir Well, Dr. Kamath, I think uh, you've touched upon the answer again in your question. I, I did start my master's degree at the National Institute of Virology in Pune. So I do know that India has excellent infrastructure for virology research, and perhaps there are bigger problems. There, there's hepatitis E, there's dengue, there's, there are other pathogens that are bigger concerns perhaps in India. 
But um, this actually would be a question for the government. <laughs> it's uh, I don't have a good response for what a country should do, and I don't know. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. I oh, well, think Karen, if there are no more questions, uh, let me once again express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Banerjee and uh, extremely grateful to you on my personal behalf and on my institutional behalf. And I hope to uh, have you share your expertise with us in our future programs. God bless you and may you rise high in all your research and levels, Dr. Banerjee. Thank you. Thanks so for that. I Thanks would say the last chat between you and Dr. Kamath was an icing on the cake. And, and there was so much that you conveyed in your silence uh, for to the last question that uh, Dr. Kamath you know, posed was a very critical um, question for everybody here in these two big populous nations or India and China. But I know, I mean, I mean we have- you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Borker, the key really is, I believe, education. And all you yes. folks are doing it. Right. The more you educate, the more people know that coming in contact with these exotic species of animals will likely introduce some pathogens. I think education is key. Sure. The problem is when you have a strong policy that's condemning a practice. So when originally when NEPA happened in Bangladesh, people said, stop, stop drinking tari. Tari. You know, date palm sap is tari. That's a, that's a delicious drink in Bangladesh. Absolutely. And uh, the moment you say that, there'll be a black market for it. So, you know, you're trying to change generations of practice and you're calling it the cause of, of, of a pathogen. So instead what they then did was they started putting these bamboo covers on the pots. So bats could no longer go into it. So you can drink your tari, but put a, put a cover on it when you're collecting it. Absolutely. It's like telling us don't drink coffee every morning because coffee has a pathogen in it, right? So I think education is extremely important and perhaps educating people will fix this. Absolutely, absolutely. So once again, thanks a lot, Dr. Banerjee, and very kind of you to have spared your precious time to address all the delegates in this webinar. So that My brings pleasure. us to the end of the technical session two, and we've had two lead researchers sharing their knowledge and experience with all of us. I'm confident that this webinar has opened new vistas in our understanding of bats and zoonosis. And I'm certain, as everybody has said, uh, all the knowledge that accrues from these deliberations will help researchers to further their interest and address gaps in our information as uh, has been the loud thinking about uh, the whole issue. Uh, well, uh, requesting all participants to please fill in the feedback form uh, to receive these certificates. And before we close, it would only be appropriate for um, me to have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Suresh Kumkali, a senior faculty and principal at Don Bosco College of Agriculture in Goa, uh, to offer his closing remarks. Uh, Dr. Kumkali Akar is another Goan stalwart in the field of virology, and uh, it would only be fair for me to quickly acquaint you with his illustrious track record in academics. Currently, the principal. Uh, for postgraduate studies in plant pathology awarded by ICR, again, Merit Scholarship awarded by University of Agriculture Sciences, Darvard. Uh, Dr. Kunkali Ankar has a PhD in plant pathology and particularly specialized in plant virology. He is a postgraduate diploma in business management from Goa University. He has also postgraduate diploma in ecology and environment from the prestigious Indian Institute of Ecology and Environment, New Delhi. Um, he has a number of publications to his credit, a, a book, a few chapters, number of research papers, abstracts and conferences, and so on and so forth. He has attended a number of professional trainings. He has been a reviewer for a number of postgraduate theses and uh, research uh, journals. He has offered a lot of radio talks towards sensitization capacity building of uh, stakeholders. Very importantly, Dr. Suresh Kumkalekar is a member of American Society for Virology, the American Phytopathological Society, Indian Virological Society, Indian Society for Mycology and Plant Pathology, Indian Society for Phytopathology and Plant Pathology. It would only be, uh, you know, the best way to end today's uh, webinar with a very pertinent theme by inviting uh, Dr. Suresh Kumkalekar. So may I have you address the webinar, please, and give your closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bhokar, sir.
Uh, so, well, I'm delighted about this webinar on bats and zoonotic diseases with special reference to COVID-19 and more so because of valuable information shared by our eminent speakers, especially during these COVID-19 epidemics in many parts of the world, right? So we all will surely be benefited by scientific knowledge that we got today. I know Dr. Kamath is a harbinger in creating awareness on coronavirus in Goa. Uh, and in go government officials by contacting officials and among people by his write-up in newspapers and magazines ever since the virus was reported in China. He also indicated that there are many viruses associated with different uh, diseases in Goa. I am happy Dr. Kamath is uh, monitoring the spread of bats in Goa and probable vectors of different viruses. I appreciate his uh, compilation of all the viruses in Goan population. Well, coming to Dr. Uh, Srinivasulu, it was nice to listen to his uh, informative talk. He gave an overview on zoonosis, their categories, bats and viral zoonosis. Out of about uh, 1,435 species of bats, India is the home for about uh, 131 species. This may be a little scary considering their ability to harbor different viruses and vector them and may be responsible for epidemic of uh, particular viruses. There are possibilities of viruses and uh, uh, mutating and then recombining uh, like that is happening in swine flu. And uh, it may happen in bats. And then uh, they may export uh, the viruses to different hosts. They can expand their host and then the infectivity. Uh, Dr. Banerjee, though, mentioned about 1,400 species of bats, parallelly gave the assurance that all bats are not the carriers of vectors of viruses. However, severe coronaviruses are found in bats. We human are also vectors for uh, spreading of these viruses uh, from, uh, during our flights to different countries. We blame bats and animals for spreading the viruses, but are not talking about humans spreading the viruses to different birds and animals and other species. The studies and research on viruses is interesting and challenging, and students can accept the offer from Dr. Banerjee. As he said, anybody interested in such viruses can contact and join his lab in Canada. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, for this offer to our students and, and uh, uh, people who are interested in or doing research in viruses. But going ahead, over the past 50 years, several viruses, including Ebola virus, Marburg virus, Nipah virus, Hendra virus, SARS virus, and Middle East respiratory coronavirus, SARS viruses, have been linked to various bat species. The major modern disease, such as Ebola virus disease and Salmonella disease, are zoonosis. HIV was a zoonotic disease transmitted to human in the early part of the 20th century, though it has now mutated to a separate human-only disease. Most strains of influenza that infect humans are human diseases, although many strains of bird flu and swine flu are zoonosis. These viruses occasionally recombine with human strains of the flu and can cause pandemics such as the 1918 Spanish flu or the 2009 swine flu. Of the 1,415 pathogens known to infect humans, 60% uh, were zoonotic. More, more human, most of the human diseases originated in uh, animals. However, only diseases that routinely involve non-human to human transmission, such as rabies, are considered direct zoonosis. Many modern diseases, even epidemic diseases, started out as zoonotic disease. And it is hard to establish with certainty which disease jump from other animals to human. But there is increasing evidence from DNA and RNA sequences that measles, smallpox, influenza, HIV, and diphtheria came to humans this way. The emergence of zoonotic diseases originated with the domesticated uh, domestication of the animals. And zoonotic transmission can occur in any context in which there is contact with the consumption of animals animal products or animal derivatives. According to a report from the United Nations Environment Program and International Livestock Research Institute, large part of the causes are environmental like climate change, unsustainable agriculture, and exploitation of wildlife. 
the idea was essentially that a coronavirus from a bat had jumped to another species and then infected a human host. Another theory that the virus may have been lab made at the Wuhan Institute of Virology was almost ruled out of the consideration. Why is this? Was it not true that the scientists had collected over 19,000 bat-related samples over 16 years since the SR, uh, SARS outbreak? It's a matter of scientific matters that the scientists also thought about it. Perhaps not that it was a lab made, but definitely that it could have been one of the viruses that was being studied there and it might have escaped from the lab. An article in Nature mentioned that the bat is uh, being the most likely reservoir of the source of this new pneumonia outbreak. In this February 2020 paper, they cited that the new virus sequence share about 72 to 79 to 80% sequence identity to the SARS virus and are over 96% identical to a bad coronavirus. Between 2012 to 2015, scientists collected about 1,322 samples from mining caves in China, finding 293 diverse coronaviruses. Eight of these were beta coronaviruses and one of these eight was RATG13, which had been described in the 2000 study under the name RABTCOV slash 4991. This virus was different or divergent from the SARS virus and could be considered a new strain of this lineage. And SARS and MERS had also been caused by beta coronaviruses, as all of you are aware of these uh, incidences and then the information. Coronavirus has a RNA as genetic material and is uh, 120 to 100 uh, nanometer in size, roughly spherical particles with a linear, non-segmented, capped and polyadenylated positive sense single-stranded RNA genome that is encapsulated in a helical nucleocapsid. The envelope is derived from intracellular membranes and contains a characteristic crown of widely spaced uh, glove-shaped spikes that are 12 to 24 nanometer long. The coronavirus genome is about 27 to 31 KB in size. There are at least 50 different sites acting as open reading frames or ORF where translation can begin. The transcription allows the SARS-CoV-2 virus to encode for about 52 proteins that have non-structural, structural and accessory functions. It is unlikely that the coronavirus is lab made as the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 has several differences from other coronaviruses being the 12 base pairs uh, for insertion. The virus with the greatest genetic homology is the bad coronavirus RATG13, which shares only about 96% of its uh, genome with the SARS-CoV-2. That is 1,200 base pair difference in this genome and no laboratory technology can simultaneously handle such a big base pairs uh, modification. Though we have got technology to insert or delete uh, some of the pairs of the these uh, ATG or uh, sequences. Uh, coming to the transmission and binding, the outer projection of spikes of the coronavirus has spike proteins. The spike connects the virus and the human cell and causes the viral membrane to fuse with the cytoplasmic membrane of the human cell so that the viral RNA can be injected into the human cell. Recognition of the membrane receptors in the cells to be infected is the mechanism by which tropism occurs. The spike through its receptor binding domain, that is RBD, recognizes the membrane receptor of the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, that is ACE2 receptor, a protein expressed mainly in the lungs, heart, kidneys, and intestine. By selecting ACE2 as a target, the virus also infects or selects the main tissues uh, that it will infect. Then human trust membrane protein is serine 2, that is TMPRSS2, cleaves and activates the spike protein, which though through its fusion peptide fuses the viral membrane with the membrane of the target cell, permitting injection of the SARS-CoV-2 virus RNA into the human cell. Inside the cell, the human protein synthesizes apparatus including the ribosomes, the endoplasmic reticulum, and Golgi complex is, is uh, commandeered and then used to translate the protein of SARS-CoV-2, forming countless new variants that equip themselves to invade new cells before destroying the cell. 
which they infect and then they take over the human system. The receptor binding domain that is RBT is coronavirus protein. It binds strongly to the human ACE2 receptors. And here there is uncoating of the virus using genetic material and RNA into the human body, which further leads to the replication of the virus and development of the symptoms. The World Health Organization has designated the variants of the coronavirus as alpha, beta, gamma, and delta based on their genetic makeup, host transmission rate, and many other factors. The alpha variant was documented in uh, September 2020 in UK, beta in South Africa in 2020, gamma in Brazil in November 2020, and delta in India in October 2020, and finally mu in Colombia in January 2021. At present, 25.3 crores coronavirus cases uh, are reported from the world with a recovery of about uh, 22.9 crores and 51 lakh death cases. Presently, there are about 1.9 crores active cases across the world. In India, 3.4 crores cases were reported, out of which 3.3 crores patients recovered from the COVID-19 infection, but 4.6 lakh people lost their life. In coming to Goa, in Goa, 1.78 lakh cases were reported, out of which 1.74 lakh uh, people recovered, showing recovery rate of uh, about 97.9%, but unfortunately about uh, 3,300 people had to lose their lives since the appearance of the virus uh, cases in the state uh, about two years back. The coronavirus is reliable, detected in patients using RT-PCR tests by targeting E gene responsible for virus envelope protein, N gene involving uh, nucleoprotein, and RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, that is RDRP gene, responsible for replication of the virus. The GOVA is better equipped with uh, RT-PCR facility in addition to zero diagnostic tests uh, at present. There are many vaccines for COVID-19 in market, which include uh, Pfizer, Covishield, Covaxin, Moderna, AstraZeneca, et cetera. The COVID-19 is much in control in GOVA, but we must strive hard to prevent epidemic of this virus in Goa. The virus infects, infection may be lethal to people and therefore precautionary measures are must in line with the adage in pathology, prevention is better than always secure. The government of Goa may put their efforts in establishing a National Institute of Virology lab in Goa to detect not only the coronavirus, but many viruses associated with many diseases in population across the state. The lab will also meet the requirements of medical, agriculture, veterinary, National Institute of Oceanography, Goa University, and uh, IIT, all institutes we have in Goa. So Dr. Borkar, Dr. Sarmukadam uh, are uh, key persons in organizing this uh, webinar, and I am very thankful to them. I also thank uh, principal of uh, Carmel College uh, uh, Carmel College, Goa, for giving an, me an opportunity to share my thoughts. Uh, I'm very thankful to all of you. Thank you so much. And then be safe. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Suresh Kumkarikar, for your presence and your precious uh, time. I think you have uh, given a very erudite and detailed closing remarks, uh, which carries a lot of weight. Uh, in our mind. Thank you once again. God bless you. And now we've come to the end of this second technical session and the closing remarks as well. May I request my colleague at the Department of Zoology, Mrs. Venita Disa, to please take over and uh, give a word of thanks to everybody here for their patience and uh, precious time that they've spent with us getting familiar with different dimensions of uh, the bats and the zoonotic diseases. And this is Manoj Borkar signing off. God bless. Good night. Stay back for a while for Mrs. Vinita Disa to give you a much deserved word of appreciation and thanks. God bless. Take care. Mrs. Vinita Disa, please. Thank you, sir. Vinita, you're not being heard. Yeah. Not Am I audible? Yes, now. A little, little louder, please. Yes. Greetings to one and all. I'm Vinita Disa, Faculty Department of Zoology, Carmel College, 
it is my pleasure and privilege to express a word of gratitude and appreciation to all those who have contributed in making this international webinar on bats and zoonotic diseases with special reference to covid-19 a grand success at the outset the biodiversity research cell department of zoology carmel college wishes to express immense gratitude to our erudite speakers dr arinjay banerji research scientist and principal investigator at the laboratory of zoonotic viruses and comparative immunology vaccine and infectious disease organization university of saskatchewan canada and dr c srini vasulu director center for biodiversity and conservation studies at the osmania university hyderabad for agreeing to share their expertise with us i gratefully acknowledge the goa state biodiversity board for partnering with us and offering their technical support i thank our principal dr sister maria lizan ac for addressing us and for her active support in all the activities of our department i am grateful to dr pradeep sarmokadam member secretary goa state biodiversity board for readily agreeing to support this webinar and also accepting to address us today a big thank you to dr nand kumar kamath consultant of microbial biodiversity goa state biodiversity board for his well researched opening remarks and to dr suresh kunkalikar principal dr don bosco college of agriculture sulkodna for his wonderful and elaborate detailed concluding remarks special thanks to the head convener and organizing secretary of today's webinar dr manoj borkar for partnering with the goa state biodiversity board and meticulously organizing this webinar a word of appreciation to the faculty department of zoology and mrs reshma kerkar of gsbb for all the efforts put in to ensure that the webinar is effectively planned and executed a very big thank you to all our delegates from goa india and abroad for their sustained interest in our knowledge events we commit ourselves to have more such events in the future last but not the least we thank our almighty for the graces and blessings bestowed upon all of us thank you once again stay safe and god bless us all thank you good night good night thank you everybody stay safe god bless please do not forget to fill in the feedback form your e certificates are linked with your feedback form as soon as you fill the feedback form your e certificate will be mailed to your account once again thank you so much to all my colleagues at the department of zoology to the goa state biodiversity board and everybody god bless stay safe